Hey guys, uh, we're gonna. Sorry about that. We were streaming to the wrong platform or whatever, something like that. It doesn't matter. Uh, we got it fixed. That's a good thing. But uh, so Ashley's going to be giving a presentation. Just a reminder that I may not necessarily agree with her. Remember that we're all laymen, and this and and just like a seminary has different professors, you know, you have people with different beliefs. So this is Ashley's theory. This is her articulation of scripture, and we're going to turn it over to her. God bless. Oh, and by the way, you see the ticker at the bottom. If you have a question, put TLS before it. And super chance don't get preference. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? All right. Yes. So I'm Ashley Myers and um, I'm doing a presentation on the kingdom of God. This is my fourth one. And I'm really excited about today. I even got some biology and chemistry in there for you guys. So that's my forte. Um, my degree's in, in biology, and I'm a teacher and a mother, but most importantly, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Um, today, we're going to talk about the kingdom of God. Um, we're going to talk about two parables, because I didn't get to talk about a parable last time when we talked about Judas. And um, so we're going to do the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven. And we're also going to talk about the word gospel, and we're going to talk about... Um, the new creation in, in Christ. Okay. Don't forget to put TLS um, in front of your, your questions and that way it'll help streamline it. That way we can get people in the, the studio a lot faster this time. Um, and I just want to say thank you to the Layman Seminary, to Charles and to Janet for allowing me to present my, my theory on the kingdom. All right. So let me present here. Okay, let's go tire screen, share. Hide. All right. Looks like you guys can see it. All right. So without further ado. Okay. So my entire presentation, like the entire, entire thing is called the meritocracy of the Christ Guild. Um, so it's, it's meritorious, which means it's um, sanctification unto reward, basically. So the, it's not saying that works um, save you. It's saying that works, um, allow you to have felt more fellowship with Christ, have more positions in the kingdom of God and um, just be closer to Christ and, and rule and reign with him in the millennial kingdom. So my, my hypothesis on the kingdom of God, um, the kingdom should not be generalized as simply as heaven or salvation. This is a gross oversimplification of what is actually meant and portrayed in the text of the Bible. So the kingdom of God shouldn't be generalized is, is what I'm saying. Um, my thesis is the kingdom of God is a theocracy. It's ruled by God Almighty and is made up of three realms that are politically organized. Actually, I'm not sharing. I want to make this bigger for you guys. One second. I think that'll help. There we go. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to start over on thesis. My, so my thesis, my hypothesis is that the kingdom of God is a theocracy ruled by God Almighty and is made up of three realms that are politically organized by God in a hierarchical manner. Okay. So this is parable number three, the parable of the mustard seed. Um, I went over all of these, these definitions twice before. Um, so I'm going to kind of skim over them really quickly. So what, what we're doing is we're in, if you haven't, if you're new, we haven't, we've been going through all the parables in Matthew 13. Okay. So Matthew 12, um, is whenever the, the Pharisees had told Jesus that he's doing the works, um, his signs, wonders, and miracles by, by the power of Satan, um, you know, called Beelzebub and, 
that that that's when God went into, you know, Jesus went into all the um, well, house divided against itself cannot stand. So he basically, you know, that that was the unpardonable sin by, you know, it can't be committed today. It was only committed in the time of Jesus's ministry that they portrayed or or um, they they said that all of his works were due to the power of Satan. OK, so that was the unpardonable sin. Um, so when that when that happened, Jesus turned away from uh, away from the Jews. He stopped offering the kingdom of God to them at that point, turned and went out of the house and down by the seaside to the Gentiles. So he began speaking in parables from that point on. And he started out with the first four parables. There's seven total four parables. The first four that we're going to get through today um, are spoken directly to the Gentiles. And then he turns and goes back into the house and speaks directly to his disciples. So we'll we'll go into that in more detail. So if you want to see parable number one and two, you're going to have to go to my first and second video to see them. OK, so the good seed or the wheat or the servants and all like seven of these parables are all the children of the kingdom. So we can see that in verse 38, Jesus defines it. Um, these are specifically saved people because it has nothing to do with the unsaved. Okay, so none of these parables have anything to do with the unsaved. They must first be saved before they can understand the mysteries of the kingdom. So these are saved people who believe in the word of the kingdom and bear fruit for it. That's important. So they're bearing fruit. Okay, so the tares we went over um, last time, the wheat and the tares. So the tares are saved religious leaders. That's probably different than what you've ever heard. You probably always have heard that these are, you know, just um, they're, they're basically like unsaved people, like Satan's minions inside infiltrating the church. But you know what? If you think about it, you don't ever see unsaved people trying to infiltrate the church. They're not going to spend that much time. You know, I, I I wouldn't. Why would you want to do that if you're unsaved, if you didn't care about God? Yeah. I couldn't imagine. But I mean, maybe one in like a million. But OK, but these tares are saved religious yeah. leaders who don't believe the word of the kingdom and they seek to destroy it. And they basically become children of Satan by doing so. OK, so they basically they're traitors. They, they've changed sides. So they were saved. Um, by by the grace of God, and then they they turned to Satan and started following him. Okay, so the bad seed, Jake, 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 don't do that, babe. I'm trying to present. Okay. The bad seed is the saved, but they don't understand or believe the word of the kingdom. The man is the or the householder. Um, he sows the good seed. Is the son of man? That's Jesus. OK, the, to sow means to spread the seed, the word of the kingdom being spread to believers. That's in verse 19. Um, the enemy that sowed the tares is the devil. Jesus defines that in verse 39. The field is in this this parable. The field is the world. Verse 38. The harvest is the end of the world or the end of this age, more specifically in verse 39. And the reapers are the angels. OK, so the parable of the mustard seed goes. Um, and all of my verses are in, are in King James uh, version. Another parable put he forth unto them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and become becometh a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Okay, the central focus of all of these seven parables is fruit bearing for the kingdom of God. Okay, so we're still looking at fruit bearing, bearing that's in verse 31, and will remain so in all seven parables. You can begin to see the seven parables begin to set up in a chronological order. So this happens in the kingdom first, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens in the kingdom, taking us through the dispensation. OK, so from from the time of Christ to the time of his return. Um, Satan continues his attempt to stop fruit bearing. This parable shows the conditions eventually produced by the tares in the previous parable. OK, so you remember what the tares were. The tares were sown 
Um, they were, they were believers. They were like religious leaders because they had heard the word of the kingdom, but they turned from the word of the kingdom and they started seeking to destroy it. Okay. So maybe they went back into legalism or something like that. Like they wanted to follow, or, you know, they were convicted by like their other fellow Jews, you know, and they, they got back into legalism and following the, following the law and stuff like that. Cause that happened often um, with believers. And a lot of times they would get, you know, punished and kicked out of syn synagogues. They would get shunned. You know, there were all kinds of horrible things that would happen to them. Um, they wouldn't even be considered a Jew anymore. Like they would literally shun them. So a lot of people fell prey to that and, and gave in and bent, bent under the pressure. Um, so that these are the people that that bent under the pressure and actually they didn't just stop like they they joined the other side and started seeking to destroy the word of the kingdom. And you see this all through the book of Acts. Um, they literally follow him around from city to city. They find out where he's going and they follow him and they stone him to death. And I'm talking about Paul. They stone him to death. He gets back up. He, he keeps preaching. So. um that's like those people. The tares are like those people. Okay. So some of them, not all of them, some of them never believed the word of the kingdom. Some of them, I guarantee you had at once believed the word of the kingdom and then turned because of the, you know, the persecution and stuff by their fellow peers. All right. So another parable put he forth unto them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed. The mustard seed is the good seed. Remember, the good seed is the children of the kingdom trying to bear fruit for the kingdom, defined in verse 38, which a man, well, who's the man? The man is Jesus. He defines that for us in verse 37, took and he sowed, sowed the verb, the act of spreading the seed. So who did he spread it to? All of his disciples, you know, his 12 apostles and then to the 70 and then to, you know, Continue, continue, continue. He sowed, sowed, sowed for three years. Okay, the word of the kingdom being spread to believers for the purpose of bearing fruit for the kingdom. In verse 19, in the first part of, of all of the gospels, the kingdom was actually in view. He was ready to bring the kingdom forth. Okay, it was ready to be realized on earth. All they had to do was have national repentance, you know, and, and turning to God. Um, the whole, the nation of Israel. And that's all defined in like the whole Old Testament and everything. So they just needed to repent and turn to him, but they didn't because the religious leaders re rejected him. So if the religious re leaders reject him, then the people reject him. So that's why they, you know, Jesus said that you shut up the kingdom. All right. So to in his field, OK, so to the world. So he's he's spreading the word of the kingdom to the world. And, um, you know, Jesus does start out with uh, with just the Jews, but he does start, you know, talking to some Gentiles in the middle and, and then towards the end, too. So you can see him working his way through the field. Which indeed is the least of all the seeds. Well, the. Like if you ever seen a mustard seed, it's teeny tiny. It really is. It's very, very small. You can barely see it. It's kind of like a carrot seed, you know? So the number, so that, that indicates the number of good seed started out small with the disciples of Christ who were taught directly by Christ and can, can be assured that the message of the gospel was given accurately. It was given directly by Jesus Christ. So they knew the, the message right, you know? So it was very accurate. Um, they understood it accurately, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree. Okay. An herb doesn't become a tree. If you know anything about, you know, herbs, an herb never becomes a tree ever, ever, ever. An herb is herbaceous. It's a, not, not woody. A tree is a woody plant. Um, they're completely different. And this is not um, evolution where things become other things. Like, so that doesn't happen in real life. Um, so herbs don't become trees. So that's, that's like, whoa, if, if you know anything about, about, you know, plants, you'd be like, whoa, what just happened? Okay. So the reader should immediately notice that something's not right. 
The mustard seed begins to grow naturally, but quickly turns unnatural. Then all of a sudden the herb or herbaceous plant turns into a tree, a woody plant. That doesn't happen. Natural versus unnatural growth. The word of the kingdom goes out to the world for the purpose to bear fruit and natural growth or fruit bearing success is seen in the beginning. Okay. So they're, and you definitely see this, especially in the book of Acts, they're, they're having a harvest, you know, like just a harvest of souls um, coming, you know, to, to, to coming to Christ. And so being saved and being saved, you know, their soul being saved, basically. Um, so when I say that, I don't mean like being regenerated. I mean, so when I say regenerated, their spirit gets saved. When their soul is saved, okay, that has to do with their sanctification and everything. So so you see a whole harvest of, of spirit and soul, you know, people getting actually regenerated and actually saved. Okay, for the purpose of the kingdom, you know, to become to become heirs of the kingdom. All right. So it quickly turns unnatural. OK. And over time, it grows into a tree. Uh Oh, that's not good. People. Some people say it's good. That's, that's not good. We can see it changing into something other than what God intended. God didn't intend for it to be a tree. He intended it for it to be, you know, a, a mustard plant. So what do trees represent in the Bible? So a specific group of people. So when you look at a tree, it usually represents a specific group of people or a kingdom or a specific nationality of people or maybe a ruler. So like if you look at like in Daniel, um, Nebuchadnezzar, it says that he was the tree. And you could even interpret that as um, like his kingdom was the tree, too. So right here is tree grew strong and then he starts, Daniel starts to interpret the vision right here. Okay. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong and whose sight reached into the heavens and the sight thereof to all of the earth, whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much, and it was meat for all under which the beasts of the fields dwelt and upon the branches of the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. Fowls are not good in this sense. They're unclean. Like it's the, they use the word for the unclean, you know, birds. Okay. And he said, it is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong. So he's saying you are the tree, O king. Okay. So there's just one proof of that. And you can, I'm going to share my slides with you. If you want more proof of that, there's, there's more talk about the trees. So trees represent um, the Christian leaders. OK, they begin to grow. They begin growing naturally, but it quickly turns up to unnatural growth. So just think of like, you know, it's not long before Emperor Constantine is forcing Christianity down an entire nation's throat. OK, abolishing all other gods and saying you must worship this God, but you're going to worship it my way. OK, and, and then he um, he brings in pagan idolatry and forms the, the Catholic Church through that. Okay, so barrenness over time caused by false doctrine sowed from saved religious leaders, the tares. Okay, so they're sowing a, a different word of the kingdom. Like you remember whenever um, the, Th the Thessalonians, they got the, the letter saying that the kingdom had already come and like that the rapture had already happened. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, so they're preaching heresy who arose from within the church. Okay, so these religious leaders, they arose from within the church. They turned, they were traitors, and they started preaching a different gospel, okay, a different, a different gospel of the kingdom. So there are numerous warnings of false teachers, and I couldn't even begin to list all of them. I mean, there's books written on just, like, warnings from, you know, from false teachers. Like, it's all through from all, all of the, the writers talk about beware of the wolves. Okay, so with they're from within the sheepfold. They're coming in to teach a false doctrine. Okay, so let's look at one of these. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, also of your own, own selves, 
also of your own selves. Okay, did you hear that? Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw you away, to draw away disciples after them. Okay, so from within the church, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one of you night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all of them which are sanctified, among all the ones that are sanctified. Okay, only among the ones that are sanctified. Okay, so that leaves out all the carnal Christians. So that's, you know, why I'm trying to get this across to you, because if you are, and I'm not judging because I was, you know, I want you to know, I think it's really important because, you know, it's, it's your eternity that's at stake, not your, you know, being saved or unsaved. Like all the Christians are going to, to heaven as everybody would call it. But I want you to be able to serve Christ. I don't want you upset or sad or, you know, like remorseful at the judgment seat of Christ when you don't get what you, you, you know, want when you see everybody else getting rewards. That's, that's my goal is so that you can inherit the kingdom. That's why I'm doing this. That's why I'm spending all my time. That's why I'm spending time away from my kids and I spend hours upon hours doing this, these slides and, and these pre presentations for you guys. Okay. So that's just one verse. There's many Christians who heed Jesus's warning of the message of the kingdom become increasingly corrupt and realize that these are the last of the last days should put two and two together and understand that the majority of Christianity, the, the majority of Christian doctrine today is corrupt. OK, it, it really is. And if you're following one of the mainline doctrines, the majority views you're you can pretty much guarantee you're following false teaching because you know Jesus warned us that it's going to become more and more corrupt and I'm going to show you that today with the, through the parables okay so here's um, a chart so like I of all the Christian denominations look at Roman Catholic it's like it's more than half so you know it's pretty safe to say if you're in that category you're definitely not right. If you're in one of the bigger categories, you better be careful. And I'm telling you, even maybe I'm telling you every single one of the categories has stuff wrong. There's not a single one that has that has everything right. And I, I don't have everything right, but Jesus tells us that it's corrupt by the end, you know. So are we going to believe him or not? So if you like hold to your denomination, um. More than you hold to the Bible, you better think twice because Jesus tells us that, you know, the word is corrupt by the end. So you better start getting into the Bible and not just, you know, reading everything based on your denomination, denominational beliefs with like presuppositions, like try to read the word. OK, so kingdom of God refresher. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. OK, so there's three different realms of the kingdom. Okay, one kingdom of God, the whole thing, one kingdom with three different realms, the third heaven where God rules on his throne and Jesus Christ is currently sitting and acting as high priest, not as king. Jesus is not king right now. Okay, Jesus is the high priest right now. That's he's acting on our behalf, interceding for us, for our sins. Um, the second heaven is where Satan and his fallen angels are ruling from above the earth. Okay, but. It's going to be um, taken from him by the one who defeated him, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is during his new, um, <clears throat> during the millennial kingdom, when Jesus comes into his kingdom and gets crowned as king, he will appoint new rulership. So this is what the kingdom is, this being offered to the Jews during the exodus and during Christ's ministry, but they rejected it and Christ gave it to his new creation or the bride in Matthew 13, 1 and 21, 43, and also in Acts 28, 28. Okay, so the New Testament saints will rule from the city of reward. The city of reward is in the second heaven. Okay, the city of reward is the new Jerusalem that comes down and hovers over the earth. 
The first heaven is the earth. So from, from the ground to the atmosphere, to the, you know, the edge of our at atmosphere. Um, Satan also rules the earth too. He just rules from the second heaven. That doesn't mean he can't come here, but you know, he doesn't come here very often. Most of the time he's, he's in front of, of God accusing us. He's the accuser of the brethren. Um, but he has a whole slew. He has one third of the angels that fell that are working for him. Okay. That, that run things often. And that doesn't mean that they can't come either, but they all have, they have to have permission. They can't just show up in the sky and stuff like that. Like they, they, everything has to have permission from God. And you can definitely see that through the book of Job. Like they have to have permission to even touch somebody. Okay. So, so he points his angels over the cities. I'm going to show you this in Daniel 4, 26. So hopefully you believe me on this. Okay. So it says that the heavens do rule. So and whereas they command commanded to leave the stump and the tree roots. Okay. So this is talking about them cutting down the tree. Uh, let's see. The watchers, the holy ones, the angels, okay, that we would call them. The angels come and they cut down the tree. They cut down the tree of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. So, but they're commanded to leave the trunk, the, the stump and the tree roots. The kingdom shall be sure to sure unto thee. After that, thou shall have known that the heavens do rule. So he's teaching them a lesson. You know, he's not, you're not in charge. Like the heavens are in charge. I'm in charge. Okay. So there's that part. Satan also rules with his angels through human kings and leaders having jurisdiction to oppress and influence them. Um, you know, I don't think that anybody would argue with me that Satan can oppress people and influence them. The Today, the only nation he has no control over is the nation of Israel. So in Daniel 10, 21, we see that um, that Michael is the head, is the prince of, of Jerusalem. OK, so but I will show show thee that which is noted in scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things. But Michael, your prince. OK, so he's speaking to Daniel. So uh, Michael was trying to get to Daniel at that time and, and Satan withheld him. So he actually had to fight with the prince of Persia. That's not an, a you know, that's not an earthly person. That's not a person, a human being, because if an angel fought with a human being, it would be over in a split second. So he's fighting with another angel here to get get to Mike or get to Daniel. So um, the prince of of Jerusalem is Michael. And you have to remember that Daniel was not in Jerusalem at that time. So that's what you know, you ask, well, why do you have to fight to get to his own person? Well, he wasn't he was in Babylon. So he had to go through the, the you know, the, the fallen angel to get to to Daniel. Um, OK. We also see that in 12, one, two. So in that time shall Michael stand up the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. Okay. So this is talking about the, the Jacob's trouble, the, the tribulation. Okay. So he is the prince of, of Israel. So he will, he rules over Israel. And that's the only jurisdiction in the entire earth that a good angel has control over. Um, and obviously, you know, Michael has to answer to God, just like the fallen angels do. All right. So Jesus is going to deliver the final blow at the end of the tribulation where Satan, Satan will be dethroned and Jesus will be appointed. It will appoint his Old Testament saints to rule over the earth after Christ's coming, being ruled by being being ruled by the healed nation of Israel, according to the promises given in David. OK, so these are like covenants, the promises that that where where God tells David that he is going to set up his kingdom forever. OK, so and David's waiting to be resurrected to to sit on his throne again. OK. So the gospel. Now we're getting into we're done with the parable. We'll get we'll get into another parable here in a bit, but. We're going to talk about the gospel for a little bit. Okay, so the gospel, the definition. I feel like people um, misunderstand what gospel is. Every time they hear the word gospel, they think of automatically somebody being saved. If you ask somebody what the Bible is written for, and if I say the Bible is written to the saved, right? 
And everybody's going to shake their head. Yeah, it's written for the saved. I'm not written for the unsaved. That doesn't make any sense. Like, why would like an unsaved person sit there and like read and understand the Bible? And in fact, the Bible says that they can understand it. So the Bible is not written for the lost. You know, it's not written for the people who are unsaved or unregenerate, never believers. The Bible is written for believers. It's the instruction manual for life, like to tell us how to live, how, how God wants us to live a holy life to be so we can be sanctified, so we can receive reward um, at the judgment seat of Christ and in and, and, and eternity eternity so we can hear well done my good and faithful servant so we can continue to serve jesus and have close fel fellowship with him so we can get all the rewards and blessings okay so the definition of gospel here's three different ones from three different places the gospel is a reward for good tidings or good tidings that's the outline of biblical usage and that's also thayer's too um, number two, a, a good message. That's from the Strongs. And number three, a good or joyful message. That's Webster, 1828. You don't hear anything about like, oh, Jesus died on the cross and he rose again and he's coming back for us and he saves us from, us from our sins. You don't see, you don't see that in the definition, right? It's not there. Okay. So Gospel means a reward. It's a good tiding or a good message. Okay, so equating the word gospel with eternal salvation or regeneration every time you see it is an error. Um, it is an assumption that may impose upon the text today. And saying, so here's a verse and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Mark 1 15. The book of Mark is not an evangelistic book. Yonder. Come here. The book of Mark is not an evangelistic book. And if it was, then Mark got the salvation message wrong. Or Mark and John are not are at odds because everyone agrees that John is the evangelistic book. And he doesn't mention repentance one time. But all the other synoptic gospels, it's always, you know, repent ye. And, and and be baptized too. repent and be baptized, um, you know, turn back to God and be baptized. Well, that's not a salvation message. Um, that's not what you do to be saved. OK, and if it was they're they're all conflicting because one says repent, one says repent and be baptized. You know, the other one says just believe. So which one's right? OK, so if you can rightly divide this and, and realize that gospel doesn't just mean you know, salvation, regeneration, then you can start to understand a lot better um, what that message is trying to tell you. You got to look at the context. All right. So looking at this verse in context, the gospel in this context is the word of God being fulfilled and the kingdom being at hand. This is the good news. Okay. So that's the good news is the kingdom is at hand. And it was. Then repentance can be viewed as the precept like the beginning, before, what comes before. The command that God gave Israel for national repentance in Deuteronomy chapter 30. In summary, when the nation turns back to God and obeys his word, then he will return and set up the kingdom for them to possess it. Okay, so that's what the message was through the whole, um, you know, through the whole um, Old Testament, that national repentance and he's going to turn back and he's going to he's going to fulfill the kingdom on earth. OK, so here here is Jesus Christ. Here's the Messiah saying, OK, it's time. I'm here. It's time to repent and turn back to me. OK, turn back to me, not be saved and, and turn to me. It's turn back to me. That's what, you know, repentance means. It means turn back. So they were already saved, you know, in, in my opinion, in, in my viewpoint. So they just need to turn back to God. They, they need to stop doing all the legalistic stuff, stop making all the man-made doctrines and turn back to him. Okay. So if they would have done that, man, we would have been in trouble. We wouldn't, we, uh, well, you know, we probably wouldn't be here to be honest with you because the, the, you know, Jesus would have brought the kingdom and that would have changed everything and a whole series of events would have, and we wouldn't be here. So the gospel, if you, if you see the gospel 
of the grace of God. Okay, so the gospel of the grace of God is the salvation message, is the regeneration message. Okay, so this is what it is in a nutshell. God, because of his love for fallen man who had been created in his image after his likeness for a purpose. Okay, that's Genesis 1, 26 and 28. Gave his only begotten son, 1 Corinthians 15, 3. That whosoever believeth in him, Acts 16, 31, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Should I go into that? Okay, Genesis 1, 26 and 28. Okay, so he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all of the earth and over all the creeping things that creepeth upon the earth. Let them have dominion. Let them rule over. Genesis 128, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Subdue it. That's another term for rulership. And have dominion again over the fish of the sea, over the fowls of the air, over the every living thing that move, moveth upon the earth. So he gave his only begotten son, 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That whosoever believeth in him, Acts 31, 16, 31, sorry. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. So that's the Philippian jailer. Um, so whenever he gets scared, he falls down and he says, what, sirs, what must I do to be saved? We know he's unsaved. Okay. So this is the gospel message, you know, being preached right there. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's it. It's easy. So being saved, you know, but by regeneration, like believing, initially believing is super easy. You know, it, what what's hard is, is living your life and, and giving your life to Jesus and being a disciple and, and choosing to serve him now on this earth. You don't have to. You can get saved and you don't have to serve Jesus. But if you do, then... There's so many good things coming for you. Okay. I got to stop for like two seconds because I'm pretty sure my son just locked my dog in the bathroom and that's why she's been whining. I'll, I'll be back in like less than 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, so let me just talk to the audience while uh, Ashley's gone. So uh, we have some of uh, uh, people that watch Corey Miner's channel. <laughs> Corey Miner and I, Janet, can you mute her mic until she comes back? Uh, sorry, guys. Sorry. That's no, all right. She's back. She's muted. Go, go ahead and I'll mute. Yeah, I, I just want to say that Corey's a dispensationalist. We're dispensationalists as well. The difference is, is we're free grace dispensationalists, and so we've dealt with uh, certain implications, certain issues involved, uh, and you know. And, you know, she's given her particular views on things. Janet, you're showing the screen, everybody, all the comments right now. <laughs> uh, you got to remember, you, you got to stop sharing the screen. Uh, or oh, that's Ashley doing it. My bad. Well, regardless, uh, here, let's see. Okay. Anyway, my point is, is that you may hear some things you may have questions about. This is your time to ask them whenever she finishes her presentation. Put TLS in front of your questions so that we will get to that. Okay, go ahead, Ashley. Unmute yourself. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Sorry, there's no way I can not go back to the stream yard to unmute myself, right? Is that what you're uh, talking about? I was showing all the com comments in like the stream yard? Yeah. Well, it's fine. It's fine. You because okay. you were sharing your screen. Uh, yeah. it's, I don't know. I don't know how okay. to put it. I thought Janet did it. No, but. if it but can, is it is it possible to like mute myself or to quit sharing from? Yes, you can. Screen? You can. You can remove your screen share, and then whenever you do that, it won't share. 
at that point. How do you do that without going back to the stream yard, though? Oh, you can't. That I know oh. of. Okay. All right. All right. All right. I'm sorry. What now? Uh, I was. Uh, it's all right. Know. We we got it taken care of. Yeah, it's good. Okay, so. Okay, so we just went over the gospel message. Okay, so. There we go. So now, if you think about it, okay, so there's a dual gospel message going out to the Samaritans and the Gentiles. In my view, the Jews are saved, okay? So they don't need the gospel of the grace of God. They know the gospel of grace of God. They've been saved. Um, there, there may even be some Samaritans that are saved, but there's definitely some Samaritans that are unsaved, and there's for sure a bunch of Gentiles that are unsaved. Okay, so not only do, so now like the, the apostles who are, you know, um, destined to go out to the Gentiles like Peter and Paul, um, they have to do a dual message. Not only do they have to get them saved first, then they have to preach the gospel of the kingdom, you know, to them and tell them, you know, basically how to live their, their, their lives, like how to be, become sanctified, how to become close to God so that they can receive what they want in eternity in the in the millennial kingdom. So the order the, the the gospel is preached is to the Jew first, then to the Samaritans, then to the Gentiles. I should have put a verse there, but I didn't. I'm sorry. Okay, so in every city, you see Paul going to the synagogues first. He always goes, every city he goes in, he always goes into the synagogues first. He's always going to the Jew first, okay? All of the people... Um, Jew or Gentile, because sometimes you do find some Gentiles in the synagogues. They can be viewed as saved if they're in the synagogues. So if you think about it, if they're believing on, on, you know, on God and his promises, then they're going to be saved. Um, it doesn't matter what works they're doing. It doesn't matter how bad they've screwed up their works. It doesn't matter how many man-made works they've created. If they're believing on, on God, then they're saved. OK, so they're believing on God, believing in the promises of God. They're looking forward to the cross and they have Jesus slain from the foundation of the world. OK, so we are lucky to know about the cross and know about the blood of Jesus. So, you know, we just know about it, but they're looking forward to it. OK, so so Jesus's blood is covering them just as much as it's covering us. So if they reject so, so Paul goes in and he's, he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom to them, not the gospel of the grace of God to save them. They're already saved. He's talking about the kingdom. If they reject the gospel of the kingdom in the synagogues, well, they don't become unsaved. They're just rejecting the gospel of the kingdom. Okay. So they're not, they're not, they're choosing to not believe on Jesus as, as, you know, as the Messiah, but you got to consider this, that they were there and alive before Jesus's ministry even began. So you can't possibly say, well, they have to believe on Jesus. You know, no, they don't because they are, they, they were alive before Jesus started his ministry. And Jesus didn't even, you know, come out and say, I am God until like the very end or close to the very end. Like he did, he didn't come out and say like, I am the one until the, you know, closer to the end. Um, so, you know, those people were were believing in the promises of God. They were they were sacrificing the Paschal Lamb, which which the sacrifice doesn't save them. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that it it's like it it uh, foreshadowed you know Jesus Christ being slain. You know the the Lamb being slain. Okay. So if they reject the gospel of the kingdom. And then you see Paul going out to the streets, okay? And he starts street preaching. Um, he, he draws big crowds. Um, you can absolutely assume that there are unsaved people in these crowds when he, when he goes out of the synagogue and starts preaching in the streets. Like definitely 100%, there's some unsaved people there. So he's not only preaching the gospel of the kingdom, he has to very first preach the gospel of the grace of God. To, because he has saved and unsaved people in front of him. 
So he has to preach the gospel of the grace of God first and then immediately after preach the gospel of the kingdom. OK, so he has to he has to get them saved and then he has to immediately start discipling them. You don't ever, ever see Paul like getting somebody saved and walking away like a lot of people do today. Like he is responsible for them. He feels personally responsible for them. We can see that in his letters. We can see his heart for, for, for the people that he has, you know, saved. Um, well, not he has saved, you know, obviously Jesus saved them. But, you know, that he was, you know, that the Holy Spirit helped him save. Like you can see that he feels personally responsible for these people. So he immediately starts um, talking about the kingdom of God and discipleship. He starts discipling them through the kingdom of God, through the word of the kingdom. And you see him baptizing him them after that. And um, so it's, it's about discipleship, you know, so he gets them saved and then he immediately starts discipling them. So examples of the gospel of the grace of God in action. So here's, these are verses. These are all verses from the Bible. So, and being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the con conversion of the Gentiles. Okay. So we can, we can pretty much assume this is, the, he's talking about the gospel of the grace of God. And, and you can guarantee that he, he talked about the gospel of the kingdom also directly after, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when this is verse seven, I went from verse three to seven, just in case, You'd like to start looking at this. And when there, there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, you know how, you know how that a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Okay. So this one, you know, the word of the gospel and this one, you could definitely say that this one is, you know, the gospel of the grace of God. And you could technically say it's the gospel of the kingdom, both of them going out. Okay, so, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. So here's directly, here's them, him being saved. Believe on the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Immediately after, started talking about the word of the kingdom, started, you know, teaching them and discipling them in the word of the Lord, um, you know, to, to disciple them. Oops. Um, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Right there it is. Okay, so this is specifically talking about regeneration, the regeneration gospel, you know, preaching the, the person, the, um, the, the promise, and um, the, why do I always forget the third one? <sighs> what he's going to do for you, you know, the provision. Okay, there we go. Okay, so then this is my favorite one on Mars Hill. I love the sermon on Mars Hill. It's like one of my favorites. Um, there are certain philosophers of the Ep Epicureans and the Stoics encounter him. And some said, what will this blabber say? Others say he seemeth to be a setter forth of straight, strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus. He preached unto them Jesus. This is a salvation message. Okay. So he is, he's talking to unsaved people and he's preaching to them Jesus and the resurrection. Ding, ding, ding. That's a clue. Okay. So this is, he's talking to unsaved people. They're, they're saying, well, he's a blabbler. And then, you know, they're all into um, philosophy and stuff like that. So they, they're, they're arguing with each other on their streets over philosophy. And some of them really like to hear it. So they hear it. So they stay to hear Paul out. Okay. So Paul stands in front of them. It says, and then Paul stood 
in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. A lot of people, if you look at the King James, like it look, kind of looks like a bad thing, but he's, a, he's actually giving them a compliment. He's saying, listen, you, you worship these gods and you are very... Um, you know, you're, you're very careful and religious about it and you pay attention to detail and you do, you know, you, you follow the rules of, of your religion. Okay. So you abide to your religion very well. He's given him a, a compliment. So you can see he's, he's, he's trying to appeal to them in the best way possible to get them to hear the word of God. Okay. So he's not going to go and, and be mean to them because they're just going to turn around and leave like an unsafe person. You don't do that to an unsafe person. Do you do that when you minister to uns I hope not. You know, you, you're not going to get very many people saved like that. So for as I passed by and beheld your devotion, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship because they had. I'm sorry, I keep doing, you know, I. Hopefully you're watching the screen and realize that I'm talking and not the Bible talking, but like they worship so many gods that they were so worried. This is the superstitious part. They were so worried about not um, the missing one about, you know, about missing one. And, and then that God getting mad at them that they put up a, a statue to the unknown God just in case they missed one. OK, so that's what this is about. Um, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him declare I unto you. So, so Paul is going, I know who the unknown God is. And they're like, oh, who's the unknown? We want to know who's this unknown God. We really want to know this. Okay. So, um, so he's got their attention, you know, which is brilliant. Um, he, so him, I, de him declare I unto you. So now, you know, Paul's going to tell him all about, about God, God that made the world. So he starts at the beginning. Look at this. Okay. So he he's evangelizing them. He's starting at the beginning. God made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshiped with men's hands as though he needs needed anything seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things and that hath made of one blood, all nations of men for to dwell on all of the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord. If happily they might feel, feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us for in him, we live and move and have our beings being as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring for so much. Then we are the offspring of God. We ought not to think that the God, the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by the art and man's device and the times of this ignorance. God winked at it but now commendeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, Jesus Christ, whereof he hath given assurance to unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some of them mocked and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed among the which was Dionysus and Arabagate and a woman named Demarius and the others with them. OK, that was pretty fantastic, I thought. Um, you know, I think Paul's pretty brilliant in, in seeing and appealing to their, you know, to to. I mean, as a teacher, that's what you want to do. That's what you have to do as a teacher. Like you get you want you want to know like the kids interest and you try to appeal to their interests in order to teach them a subject. You know, you try to relate to them. And that's exactly what Paul was brilliant at. Um, so he actually got some unsaved people saved right here. 
And you can see he started at the beginning. He talked about the resurrection. He talked about the deity of Christ. You know, um, he talked about his the promises of God, of him, of him coming back. He even got a little bit into the kingdom. So, yeah, it's a it's a fantastic message here to look at. Okay, so the gospel, gospel of Matthew is the gospel of the kingdom. So what do I mean by that? Well, the kingdom is actually referenced 56 times just in the gospel of Matthew. Jesus lays out the gospel of the kingdom and in, I suppose to say, in perfect detail. And the cert, man, I must have been typing fast. He laid out it. He laid out the kingdom of God in perfect detail with the Sermon of the Mount um, for his saved Jewish audience. So this is, he's basically laying it all out. This is exactly what you need to do, how you need to be. They call it the be attitudes, not, not like how, how you need to be, um, or not what you need to do is how you need to be like your, your attitude towards life, like your, your inwardness too. Like, so it's, it's not just about doing things. It's what's inside of you also. So Jesus lays that all out, you know, on the table because they were so legalistic. They were like, do, 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 do. I need to follow this and do that and wash my cup and, and, you know, all that stuff. So yeah, is Jesus is trying to tell them it's not all about do, do, do. It's about what's in here. Okay. So Matthew three, two and four 17, um, John and Jesus's first words are repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand or repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is nigh. Um, Matthew chapters five through seven during the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, there we go. He lays out the requirements for becoming co-heirs with him in the heavenly portion of the kingdom where he will be seated on his throne. OK, so he's not going to be seated on David's throne. David's going to be on his throne. Well, where's Jesus going to be? He's going to be in the second heaven, in the city of reward, in the new Jerusalem with the Christian saints. OK, so with the with the saints who he chooses to rule and reign with him. So in the sermon, um, he explains how you need to be, not what you need to do. There we go to inherit the kingdom. And his audience is specifically to his people, Israel, but more specifically to his disciples. So you can't say that his disciples are not saved. I mean, I really, really hope you don't say that they're not saved. I really hope so. So in Matthew 5, 1, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain and he was set his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, so then he goes through the whole sermon on the Mount. He's teaching his disciples specifically. Okay. So yes, they've already been saved. Like he's teaching them how to inherit the kingdom. Okay. So got the gospel of the kingdom in a nutshell, um, Arlen, I stole this from Arlen Chitwood. So the good news had to do with the mystery revealed to Paul by the Lord, evidently after he had been taken to Arabia, then into heaven. Okay, I don't think anybody would argue with that, but there's the verses. It had to do with believing Jews and Gentiles being placed together in the same body as fellow heirs or joint heirs. Okay, let's look at that verse real quick. Okay, so for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Okay, if you're unsaved, you're not going to be like, you're not going to be understanding a mystery of Christ, let alone the Bible or the word of God, word of God. Okay. So, cause the Holy spirit is what helps you, you know, like understand, um, understand the word, which is other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Okay. So it's not saying that it was completely lost in the old Testament. It wasn't there. That's not what mystery means. Mystery means that it was, kind of like um it they he did, like God didn't come right out and tell people he he told people more in like a picture and a type and um you know kind of like foreshadowed it like this is what's going to happen by like oh you know um 
Abraham sacrificing Isaac, you know, was was kind of like, you know, um, was meant to show of Jesus's sacrifice, I think. And like Joseph, he was like a type of Christ. He was, um, you know, I don't I don't think the Bible said one bad thing about Joseph, not one single thing. Um, but there's all kinds of like pictures. I think you would agree with me in the Old Testament where it kind of like foreshadowed, you know, Jesus Christ, like what was going to happen and the church too. Um, definitely never, ever talked about the church in the Old Testament other than, you know, not outright, not directly. Um, but but now, like us knowing and looking back, like we can see the church in the Old Testament. Okay. Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. And now it is revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Okay. So this word is more like um, the word for like children. Okay. So they're going to be fellow heirs. They're going to be children of God. Okay. So and of the same body and partakers of the promises in Christ by the gospel. Where, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual workings of his power unto me who am less than the least of all the saints is the grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, the fellowship of the mystery fellowship, meaning like, um, you know, um, uh, Oh man, I'm drawing a blank. Um, like having closeness to fe if you fellowship, okay, you you have closeness with other people who believe what you believe, okay. So from which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Who's he talking about there? The principalities and powers in heavenly places, none other than Satan and his his fallen angels who are ruling over the earth as we, you know, as we speak. So according to the eternal purpose, okay, so the eternal purpose, so we're talking about the millennial kingdom, what's happening after um, the resurrection, which he, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Okay, so this is talking about them becoming children and then further how... They need to become um, discipled and and saved their the salvation of the soul. OK, so have their soul saved after their spirit is saved. All right. So. We're becoming fellow heirs and these Jewish and Gentile believers or Christians together possessed a hope relative to one day occupying a position of honor and glory with Christ in his heavenly kingdom. Okay, so we're going to occupy a power of, of glory, a uh, uh, position of glory. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that, that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory for forever and ever. Amen. OK, so that's talking about his discipleship, um, his his sanctification on earth and then being delivered into the heavenly kingdom because he is serving Christ. OK, and Paul referred to the good news pertaining to this message as my gospel. OK, this is Paul's gospel. So this is the gospel of the kingdom. So now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. Okay. So to him that has power to establish you, that's Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God, and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Okay. According to the revelation of the mystery. So preaching of Jesus Christ could be taken as, you know, if they're unsaved, he's preaching, they're preaching Jesus Christ to him as death, burial, resurrection, promises of God. Um, the deity of Christ. So according to the revelation of the mystery, so that's talking about the kingdom of God, which was kept secret since the world began. 
Okay. He also calls it our gospel. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Um, the glorious gospel of Christ, that's another term for it. The, these are all terms for the gospel of the kingdom. The glorious gospel of Christ. Hold on, what did I do? I thought I clicked on that. Um, oh, yeah. Or the gospel of the glory of Christ also. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. In whom God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not the gospel of the, the of the kingdom, least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Um, okay, the gospel of God is also the same term of, for the gospel of the kingdom. Romans 1 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto God, separated unto the gospel of God. Okay, so he's preaching the word of the kingdom to people. Um, for 2 Corinthians 11, 7, have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? Okay, you're not exalted, you know, just from being, from being saved. Um, you're a child of God, of course. Um, but you don't automatically inherit the kingdom. You don't automatically rule just because you believe in God. Um, and that's the exact same mistake that the Pharisees made. They said, I'm a child of Abraham. I'm of Abraham. Like we're children of Abraham. So we're going to get the rule automatically. So I don't know what you're talking about, Jesus, but that's my position. And, um, you know, you're wrong. That's what they told him. They said that I'm going to rule. I don't know what you're talking about. So I don't have to do anything that you say. Um, that's a big mistake that the Pharisees made. They, they thought that their nationality, you know, who, who they were born you know, into that was going to give them rulership. Just like the Christians today think that just because I'm a Christian, it doesn't matter how I live. I don't, that doesn't matter. I'm going to be, I'm going to rule and reign with Christ. Okay. So they could be out at the bar. They could be going to rock concerts. They could be never going to church, uh, cussing up a storm often. And they, they, you know, they could just not even be a servant of Christ at all. But they think that they're going to rule and reign with Christ. And that's just not right. You know, that's not going to happen. And they're going to get a big shock. Okay. The gospel of Christ, Romans 1.16 for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Just because you see the word salvation, don't freak out. Okay, it's not, this is not the gospel of, of the grace of God. Um, and this is in Romans too. So, you know, he's writing a letter to a church, to believers. Um. Okay. Yeah. So let's see Galatians 1 7. Which is not which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Okay, so they're talking about the word of the kingdom. We saw that in the mustard seed and the tares, the parables of the, you know, mustard seed and the tares, all of the parables, the wheat and tares, the 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 seeds sown in the field. All of it is about the perversion, you know, of the gospel of Christ over time. Then numerous times, Paul simply uses the word gospel alone to refer to this good news. So like in Romans 1 15, so much as, as in me is so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. Galatians 1, 6 through 12. Okay, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel. Okay, so this is talking about apostasy, like they're starting to move into 
they're they're not in complete apostasy yet because obviously they're they're still in church and he's writing to them and they're reading the letter. So, but they're moving towards apostasy. They're moving towards becoming a traitor. You know, they're starting to pervert the gospel. They're starting to become ravenous wolves. Okay, so which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But thou, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that we have that that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But if I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after men. Or man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know what? Paul doesn't have to be taught by Jesus Christ about the death, burial, and resurrection. You know, like he could easily be like he knew about that already. Like he he was there when when all that happened. There was a mystery that that Jesus gave him, and that's the mystery of the kingdom, the gospel, you know, of the kingdom. And, and, you know, basically the mystery is Jesus giving the church to the Christians to form, forming the new man in Christ. Okay. So it's used 101 times in the new Testament, the word gospel. Um, and pretty much every single time it's not referring to the gospel of the grace of God. It's not about regeneration. Now there's definitely, like I showed you some instances where there, it's like, it can, it can double. It can double like he has to get them saved first and then he has to disciple immediately after. Okay, so here's the verses where where Jesus turns from the Jews and 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 goes like to the Gentiles. So Matthew 13, one, the same day went Jesus out of the house, out of the house of where? Out of the synagogue, out of the house of the Jews, out of his house. And sat by the seaside. The seaside always represents, you know, the Gentiles. He's sitting by the seaside talking to the Gentiles. This is directly after the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit in chapter 12. He rebukes, rebukes the spiritual leaders of Israel, the Pharisees, pronouncing the judgment that will befall them temporarily and temporally, I'm sorry, temporally and spiritually and rebukes them again because the Gentiles haven't had more understanding than them, like Nineveh and the queen of the south, um, then pronounces that their house will be left desolate or empty. They would have an empty house. And that's the seven, seven demons passages where he, you know, swept it and then seven demons came back and, you know, more, more, um, you know, ravenous. Okay. And the state of the Jewish nation will be more wicked than the first until the return of Christ. Okay. So he pronounces judgment on them in, in that chapter. Um, in Matthew 21, 43, the gavel comes down and Jesus says, therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Okay, who's he talking about? He's talking about the Christians. We know that. We're looking back, right? So up, up until up until that time, and specifically it's the time of Pentecost is when the new nation was brought into existence, when the new creature was brought into existence, there was only two different categories. There was Jews and there was Gentiles. But now God bring, brings forth a new type of human. Okay, the new creature in Christ, he calls it. That's what it calls it in the King James. I think the other versions might call it a new creation. Um, but King James says new creature. So the new creature or the new creation or the new man, some verses calls it, or as we call it today, the Christian. So therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth, availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Galatians 6, 15. 
having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of, of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make, him, make in himself of twain, which means two, one new man. Okay. So making peace. Ephesians 2.15, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Ephesians 4.24, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Colossians 3.10. So who is called? No guarantees, but who is called to inherit the kingdom of the heavens? To inherit the new Jerusalem, the city of reward is located in the second heavens after Israel rejects this kingdom. So Jesus tells us who it is. You know, he's going to bring, he's going to give it to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And he creates that new nation during Pentecost. So the answer can be found in the study of the mystery of the kingdom revealed by God to Paul and Matthew. So a man will be divided into a third category, okay? So I've already read, you know, all of these about the new creation and stuff like that. Um, so I'm not going to read them again. That will form the church, the one new man in Christ in Ephesians 2, the new cre creature in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Galatians 6.15. The church in Greek is ecclesia, um, which means to be called out from among a large company. The church is distinctly separate from and hated by both the Jews and the Gentiles. The term Jew or Israel should never be mistaken for the church. We continue to see the distinction made between Jewish saints and the church saints into the millennia. With the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles written on the gates and the foundations of the city. What city? The city of reward. Uh, the new Jerusalem, and after into the age of the new heavens and the new earth. So this is pretty interesting. It says, and I saw the new heavens and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth was passed away, and there was no more seas. Okay, so here's talking about the new Jerusalem. Um, it's a prepared for the bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice, voice out of heaven saying, um, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell within them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Okay. So hold on a second. Uh, there, uh, I didn't get the verse. It's where it says that, uh, here we go. Okay. So it's talking about the city of reward, you know, and you know, which is pretty amazing. Having glory of God and her light was like unto the stone, most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And he and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates, 12 angels and the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tri tribes of the children of Israel. So right here we see the Israel they're, they have 12 gates and their their names, the 12 tribes are written on each of those gates. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And in them, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Okay. Not the 11 apostles, mind you, the 12 apostles. I wonder if Judas's name is written or if it's Matthias. Or maybe even Paul, some people argue. I don't know. I guess we're going to find out. Okay. So the church is predicted as a type in Genesis over and over again. A type is like a word picture. It's a foreshadow. It's just meaning that, you know, God doesn't completely reveal it. He doesn't come right out and say it, but he, he's, he, he builds the story to to kind of mimic what happens when Jesus comes and to, and other times too, like to mimic what happens during tribulation, mimic what happens um, like, like the Exodus and all the, the, the 10 plagues, like really align closely and mimic the, the, the vials and the, the trumpets of the, of the, um, 
of the apocalypse, you know, of the of the tribulation, of the wrath of God. So it's kind of like a picture of like what's what's to come. Um, so in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, it says, Now all these things happened unto them for and samples or types, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Okay, so Eve typifying the predestination of the bride or the church being foreordained from the foundation of the world, Adam, like Jesus, being put to sleep or death, opened up, taken out of Adam um, or Jesus. So it's showing Eve being taken out of Adam. Okay, so Eve typifies the bride being taken out of Jesus. Okay, so the bride is for Jesus. Okay, um, we can see that in Genesis 2, 22 through 3, 23 and Ephesians 1, 4. Um, and I gave a reference to like the page of the book that I got that from. Also showing distinctions being made between the whole, the whole body of the believers, the entire church typified by um, Adam's body and the chosen body of believers by the bride of Christ, typified by Adam's rib being extracted to form Eve and Eve being made one with Adam, then commanded them both to rule, subdue, and have dominion over the earth as the very first king and queen. Abraham, typifying God the Father, and Sarah, typifying God's bride, Israel, or God's wife, that technically should say, because, you know, Israel is God's wife, and he has, um, he has divorced her, but he will take her back. Eliezer, the servant, typifying God's oldest servant, the Holy Spirit, and Isaac, typifying God, the son, Jesus, and Rebecca, Jesus's wife, called from God's family. Keturah, God's restoring, is a picture of God restoring his wife, um, Israel, and her being finally fruitful. So you can see after like Sarah dies, he takes Keturah as a wife and he has multiple children. Um, you know, she's very fruitful. So we can see that, you know, God restoring his wife in that is a picture of that. And some people don't believe in types, but man, I mean, I don't know how you couldn't. I mean, maybe some people go way too far with them and, and like allegorize and stuff like that. I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but I can I can definitely see how they could be used for bad, but I can see how they can be used for good too, just just to show like pictures of what's going to happen. Okay, so again, the type the types, Isaac is God the Father, Jacob is Jesus, and Leah as Israel, the law, the earthly rule, Rachel as Israel, the gospel, and the heavenly rule. Okay, so Jacob's two wives, Leah and Rachel. Okay, so Leah representing the law and the earthly rule and Rachel representing the heavenly rule. So Isaac charged Jacob to go to go and not take a bride from the daughters of the land of Canaan, but out of his family and his mother's, bro mother's brother Laban. Jacob learns of Rachel and loves her before he even meets her, just like Christ loved us. He becomes a bondservant, but first takes Leah. Just like Jesus must first go to the Jews first, then takes Rachel becoming a bondservant again and gave himself for her like Christ did for us on the cross. Then takes his wives back home to meet his family halfway, the rapture, to live forever. Okay, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now all these things happen. Oh, I already read that one, but let's look at a couple more really quick. So Joseph as Jesus and Asenath as the bride of Christ. You can look at Moses like Jesus and Zipporah, his, his wife as the bride of Christ. And, and look at this, like they're, they're both Gentiles, right? So Jesus takes a Gentile bride. Jesus takes a Gentile bride. Boaz, like Jesus takes a Gentile bride, Ruth. David takes a Gentile bride, Abigail. And I believe, I think that might be his first wife. I'm not sure. Because he has a couple wives, but I, it's either his first or his, well, no, hold on. It's his second. Yeah, it's definitely his second wife. Sorry. Okay. 
So let's go into the parable of the leaven now. This is where it gets really interesting. So it's what it's like one verse, but there is so much in this parable. It's unreal. Like when you start breaking this down, it, it you, I mean, I think that you could really think about this for a very, very long time. Just this one verse. So here's the parable. It says, another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Like, what in the world is that about? It's... Okay, so this is the last parable spoke about, spoke out by the seaside. So it's the last parable addressed specifically to the Gentiles before he goes back into the house and addresses his disciples specifically. So don't forget that bearing fruit for the kingdom of God through spreading the word of the kingdom is still in view. So that's that's the central focus of all of these parables is fruit bearing for the kingdom. Okay, so another parable spake unto them, the kingdom of heaven is likened to. So when Jesus says that, says this, he doesn't mean the actual kingdom is like leaven. So he wouldn't be saying that because leaven represents sin. So he's not like saying the kingdom of heaven is sin. Okay. So what is in view is the word of the kingdom in verses 11 and 19. He tells us that. So he is essentially saying, this is what will happen to the word of the kingdom or the gospel of the kingdom. Okay. So another parable, he spoke unto them, the kingdom of heaven is likened to leaven. Well, what's leaven? Leaven equals sin or iniquity. And I'm going to prove that to you if you don't believe me on that. Some interpret it as a good thing, which is a mistake because leaven is never looked at as good. Okay. So there's there's a lot of people, you look at com some commentaries and stuff, they're like, oh, this is great. You know, this is the king kingdom of God. It is growing. And it's like, it's like exploding and like the whole world's just going to become Christians and we're just going to make it like that. And it's going to be great. We're just going to bring in the kingdom now. Um, so that's not what it's about. So leaven is very bad. It's sin. It represents sin. Um, they have, if, if they represent it as good, they have nothing in scripture, not a single thing to, to base that on biblically. Okay, there is multiple verses that prove this, but I'm going to go into that in more detail in a little bit. Okay, which a woman? I go, Urch, a woman? Hold on, where'd this woman come from? She took, okay, so I'm going to read again. Another parable he spoke unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman she took and hid. Oh man, she's a deceptive woman. Okay, so she's hiding it. She's hiding the leaven in, a, in three measures of meal. Well, if we just look at the number three, three always equals divine completion. Okay, till the whole was leavened. Till all of it was leavened. So leaven is a mixture of naturally occurring yeast, which is a fungus, and bacteria. So if you look at like a yeast packet today, it's basically specifically like one strain of, of a yeast. Um, but but natural naturally occurring, occurring leaven, it, it actually had many different types of yeast and like a couple different types of bacteria too. These are foreign organisms. They are, they are living organisms. They are alive. Okay. So this is, this is taking a foreign organism, a living thing, and, and introducing it into something that is supposed to be pure. So like your, um, like if you go back to Leviticus and stuff like that, and you look at the, all the offerings, um, when they're offering like flour and stuff like that, it's all, it's all white and, and pure represent, representing pureness. Okay. So you take a fungus and bacteria and introduce that into your, your dough, into, into the, the, um, flour and you're, you're introducing like corruption. It's like a, it's like, ooh, why would you do that? You know, so it's representing sin. And I told you, I'm going to prove that. Okay, so it's like the tares from, from parable number three. They're introducing a foreign organism, like a foreign, the word word of the kingdom, into 
the word of the kingdom. So they're they're corrupting the gospel. That is placed within predicting the total iniquity of the word of the kingdom. Like it's going to spread entirely through all of the word of the kingdom by the end of the dispensation. Okay, it's going to be completely left. And it is said till the whole was leavened till the whole, the whole entire thing is leavened. Okay. So this parallels the last church in Revelation 3, because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That doesn't sound very good. And that's the church of today. Okay, so we are poor and blind and naked. How do I know? That love and equals sin or iniquity. Okay, so one one disclaimer I want to say is in the King James Version, if you see the word meat, it's not talking about meat like we think about the word meat, like um, you know, like protein. Um, meat used to mean grain in the King James Version, like in not in the in back in the day. Okay, so if you said the word meat back in the day, they would think like flour and grains and stuff like that. So I just want to make that known. So in the Exodus, God commanded the Israelites to paint the three sides of the doorframe with the blood of the lamb. Then for the next seven days, they weren't allowed to eat any leaven bread. They, they had to literally get it all out of their house. OK, they had to take all the yeast, as we would call it today, like we, they had to get it out. They weren't even allowed to have it at their house. OK, so this symbolizes the removal of sin in their lives. They're getting it out. OK, so, you know, Christ is about ready to be sacrificed on the cross. So just like in the Exodus, like the, the Paschal lamb is, is typifying that, um, you know, so the, the lamb's about ready to be sacrificed. Get all the sin out of your life. OK, seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. OK, so for seven days they had to do this. Even the first day ye shall put away the leaven out of your houses for whosoever eateth leavened bread. From the first day unto the seventh day, that soul, not spirit, that soul shall be cut off from, from Israel. It's not saying that they are going to go to hell. It's saying that their soul is not being saved, meaning they're not going to rule and reign with Christ. They're not going to have fellowship with him in the millennial kingdom. They're, they're going to be in the kingdom. They're just not going to be, you know, able to serve Christ like they want to. All right. So seven days showing so they can't eat it for seven days, right? So seven days showing one full cycle, okay? Took, took God seven days for the full cycle to create the heaven and the earth on the seventh day he rested, of course, but it's a seven day cycle, right? So seven days representing their lives free from sins, from leavens. Then, then God further forbade the priests to use leaven with the meat or like the grain offerings. So this is in Leviticus, you know, further on down the road. He said, no meat offerings, which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven. For ye shall burn no leaven, nor any honey in the offerings of the Lord made by fire. Leviticus 2.11. So God's saying here that he wanted their offerings to be pure, rep representing their purity within themselves, therefore free of leaven. OK, so they don't want no. God doesn't want no sin uh, mixed in. Every offering excluded leaven except for two offerings. OK, so there's two exceptions. So these two also included a blood sacrifice, interestingly, where they sprinkled the blood. You know, so these ones included a blood sacrifice to atone for the sin linked directly to the fifth festival, the festival of weeks or Pentecost as we know it. So 50 days, this happened 50 days after, after Passover, they would have the festival of weeks. So here's what it says. Um, actually, the festival of weeks one, that's number two, but listen to the peace offering first. Okay, so the peace, peace offering is in Leviticus 7, 13 through 14. It says, besides the cakes, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread. So here you include the leaven with the bread. 
um, with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offering. And of it, he shall offer one out of the whole oblation for a heave offering unto the Lord. And it shall be the priest that sprinkleth the blood of the peace offering. Okay, so here's the second verse that, that also requires the, the leaven and a blood sacrifice. So during the week's festival or Pentecost, you shall bring out of your habitat habitation two wave loaves of two tenths two tenths deals they shall be one they shall be a fine flour representing purity but they shall be baked they shall be bacon with leaven they are the first fruits unto the lord leviticus 23 17 so interestingly this occurs 50 days after the passover and also requires the blood sacrifice. And that's further on in the verses. I just didn't have enough time. If you don't believe me, read further on. And it talks about the blood sacrifice. And um, is a picture of Christ's blood atoning for our sins. Okay, not, not at the very beginning, but now we need another atoning. Why? The leaven in the two wave loaves after the cross. This is after the cross. This is after the cross. This is after the cross. Okay, so Pentecost was after the cross. You agree with that, right? I hope so. So, so we we were commanded to keep the leaven and the sin out, but God knows that we can't. Like we're we're not perfect, like Jesus. I mean, we should try, absolutely, yes. But God made a way for us to atone for the sins after our regeneration, which is amazing. Is symbolized by 50 days after the lamb was slain, giving a peace offering of bread with leaven, symbolizing the confession of our sins, and the blood sacrifice, symbolizing Christ's atoning blood covering our sins. So if you want to know more about it when I share my slides, you can click on these two links and it has more information about all of that. But watch this. Okay. So it's going to get more interesting. So the leaven in the New Testament. Okay, when's it talk about leaven in the New Testament? So your glory, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? That doesn't sound good. Those people who say that leaven's good? No, definitely not. Read the rest of that too. It definitely shows you it's not good. Like read, you know, more into those verses. So purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Okay, so it's telling it just to get out the old man, to, to purge out the old leaven, get rid of the old sin so that you can be a new lump. And get now, now this new lump has no leaven in it at all. Because even one, one, one organism would end up leavening the whole entire lump. Even one. If you had one yeast cell or one bacterial cell, it could permeate with the right conditions and, and move through the entire thing. So therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven. We don't want old sin. Neither with the leaven from malice and wickedness. Well, that doesn't sound le like leaven is good. But with the unleavened, no leaven. Let's get out that leaven of sincerity and truth. Well, wow, it really sounds like the unleavened bread is so much better, right? Because it is. Okay. So here's where we get into a little bit of chemistry. All right. So whenever you're making bread, um, you're using your flour. Okay. So you're mixing flour, water, and salt together. Okay. So these are your proteins and, of course, your water and salt. Um, when you knead the dough... OK, it starts forming and, and getting stuck together like the gluten in it starts sticking together. OK. Um, and I'm going to I'm hold on. Sorry. I'm going to talk about the salt here in a little bit. But so if you break down flour, it breaks down into like a simple sugar. And if you didn't know that, that's why bread makes you fat, because it's basically all sugar, sugar and starches. OK, so bread. So so flour breaks down into this molecule called glucose. 
Okay, so how does the yeast, how does the leaven react with the glucose? Well, what the yeast does, which is an organism, it's actually its very own living thing, you know, it's going, it takes that glucose and it breaks it down into carbon dioxide and ethanol. Now, ethanol is a gas or is, a, is an alcohol. Okay, so anything that ends in all is alcohol. Um, so if it has that OL ending, you know, it's an alcohol. Okay. So it's going to be baked off during, during baking. Um, you know, cause al alcohols, they vaporize very, very quickly. Uh, so it, it can actually leave behind a little bit of flavor also for, for the bread, but it also breaks it down. So it takes this compound right here and it breaks it down into carbon dioxide too. So, you know, what carbon dioxide does, it makes the little bubbles. So like if you have carbon dioxide in your soda, it's make it's bubbling, bubbling, bubbling. Okay. So if you have carbon dioxide in, in dough, it bubbles, 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 same thing. And that's how you get all those little holes in bread. Okay. So in sourdough, you got just, just so in case you want to know, the ratio is a hundred bacteria to one yeast. OK, and um, it, it also forms this lactic acid. So that's just specific about, you know, talking about making sourdough breads. All right. So other ingredients that you might see in there are fats, um, baking soda, baking powder, sorbic acid um, to preserve and stuff and, and xanthan gum. OK, so they're like preservatives. All right. But salt. So the role of salt. Salt adds flavor, right? So there's, I'm pretty sure Jesus talks about salt and being flavored. Um, it adds flavor to, to bread. It actually slows down the fermentation process. So this process I just went over, the, the yeast taking the glucose, breaking it down into carbon dioxide and ethanol, um, that is fermentation, okay? So it's going to slow down the, the leavening. It's going to slow down the process of the lemon leavening and, um, you know, so it slows down like the corruption. It strengthens the gluten structure, makes dough more elastic also. OK. So this is just, you know, picture you can see the yeast and bacterial cells in here. You see the yeast is a lot bigger than the bacteria. So that's just interesting, just so you can see an actual picture of what this looks like. Um, you know, that's what goes into our, our, our bread. Um, so this is the glucose molecule that the, the flour breaks down into. When you add yeast to it, it forms that error means it forms. This is a chemical, you know, a chemical sentence, basically, um, what happens. So it's going to form that ethanol it has that OH on the end right there. The OH, the OH means it's an alcohol. Is mostly baked off and adds flavor, and it's going to form carbon dioxide. So every for every glucose molecule, you get two ethanol molecules and two carbon dioxide molecules. So the carbon dioxide molecules causes the bread to rise. Okay, you get all those those holes in there. It makes it really um, soft. It has a soft texture. Okay, and just so you know. Um, yeast is a living organism. It does not have to go through sexual reproduction and it actually goes through asexual reproduction. It can reproduce on its own by cloning. Okay. So it literally clones itself. So that's how it's spreading throughout the dough. And that's why it's how it's talking about, you know, the leaven is corrupting the dough. It's being spread out through the whole entire thing. It's not like the process of diffusion and the fact that if you spray perfume, it spreads through the whole room. It's literally a, or, a living organism that is replicating itself and, and, you know, creating more of itself to corrupt. Okay. It, under normal conditions, this is what this bottom graph, I hope you can see my cursor, this bottom graph, the one with the red on it, um, under normal conditions, if you pr place like yeast into a medium, like, a, like I don't know, like um, they place it into uh, what they used to make, uh, like wine or something like that, okay, to make, or well, grape juice, I guess, to make wine um, or flour or dough to make your, your bread. Um, it has like limiting factors. So you're going to see that, that 
organism take off, it's going to exponentially grow. It's going to ex have an exponential phase where it just like shoots off and it's replicating, replicating, replicating itself. And it seems like it's going to replicate until it's like forever. But then it kind of levels off and then you start to see a death or a decline phase. Okay. So once it runs out, it, it has limiting factors based on its environment. Once it runs out of food or water or whatever this organism needs to survive and really grow well, um, it, it will actually start to have a death phase. It will start to decline off and everything in the, and it will die eventually. Um, that's, that's how it normally happens. There's limiting reagents, limiting factors in on the earth. Okay. So we can't really replicate uh, an earth system that would have no limiting factors to where it could literally just grow exponentially forever and ever. Okay. But this is really interesting. In a lab, they were trying to replicate the like exponential growth and get it to like not level off and die. And they were actually able to do that. And you can see that by the graph, you can see the graphs going up and up and up and not leveling like this one kind of leveled off. This one kind of leveled off right here. But a lot of these graphs, you see them like growing exponentially. So that's pretty interesting. You can see total corruption and continuing corruption. So this is what Jesus is talking about, the, the corruption, you know, level, leavening the whole lump. It is leavening and leavening and leavening and leavening and leavening. And it's not stopping. It has been in the exponential phase and, you know, it, it, and then eventually that um, once it corrupts the entire word of the kingdom, like that's when Jesus is coming back, like for us. So that's interesting. So the salt back to the salt. OK, so again, one of the limiting factors here could be salt. OK, you add salt to it. Oh, look. It, it levels off and starts to die because, you know, salt, salt actually kills organisms. If you ever put salt on, um, you know, I don't know why you, I mean, I've done this because, you know, I've done this in science labs and stuff, but like, if you put like salt on a bacteria, um, if you put salt on like an ant, it's going to kill it. Um, if you put salt on, you know, organisms, cover it in salt, it's going to suck the moisture out of it and kill it pretty quickly. Okay. So you can think of salt as the restrainer, right? It's restraining the growth of the, the leaven. Okay. So salt, and here's an experiment done. This one had 0% salt added to the bread dough. Look how nice and fluffy all the holes. This one had only a 2% salt solution added to it. And you can tell the difference. Okay. You can tell that, that it really inhibited the leavening agent. This one had only 10% salt. That's not very much. And look how dense that bread is. Okay. So if you think about it, Matthew 5, 13, ye are the salt of the earth. Ye, as in the disciples of Christ, he was speaking to the, to the disciples. Okay. So the disciples, the one who follow him, the one who spread the word of the kingdom, they are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. Like speaking of a carnal Christian, if you lose your salt, if you lose your, you know, if you lose your will to serve Christ, then you're basically no good to him. Um, he's not going to send you to hell by any means, but you've, you've become no good to, to Christ. Okay, and you can see the effects of just having disciples and spreading the word of the kingdom, what it does to the leaven, just 10%. Look what it did to the leaven. And that's what, you know, I, I made this connection. I was like, wow, that's pretty good. Um, so, and I'm going to prove right here what salt does to leaven. Okay, salt, it retards the action of the natural yeast and prevents over maturing of the culture. Um, it gives it flavor, of course. Um, let's see. Let's see. Salt slows down the fermentation and the enzymes of the dough. Okay, so it slows the growth of the, the leaven. Um, slows down the growth and reproduction of the yeast in your bread dough. 
yeast are killed by salt. It disrupts their cell structure. Excessive dehydration will eventually kill the yeast and bacteria. Salt is not considered to be an, an, an aid in leavening. Definitely doesn't help the leaven. Okay, so for the mystery of iniquity, I'm in, I'm in Thessalonians now, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now restraineth will restrain until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and will destroy with the brightness of his coming. Okay, so we can see sin, iniquity, just like the leaven. Okay, so he's saying like the leaven is already working. This is like my interpretation of it. I was like, oh, yeah, this this actually works for this. Okay, so the sin, like the leaven, is already working. Okay, the corruption of the gospel. Only he, the salt of the earth, the good seed, the firstborn sons, who understand the word of the kingdom and bear fruit for it, who now restraineth, will restrain. Okay, so everybody says, well, you know, if you're if you're preaching revelation like rapture, you say, oh, like that's the Holy Spirit. But a lot of people who are not pre-tribulation rapture, like have, have kind of proven that that doesn't really work so well there. Um, now, it could be like indirectly, you know, because the salt is using the Holy Spirit, you know, to guide them. Okay, the good seed is using the Holy Spirit. They're, they're in direct fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the restrainer could be the salt of the earth, which are, you know, the people who know the word of the kingdom and, and spread that word of the kingdom. Um, so when all of that is gone, when all those people are gone, and we don't know what all means. Does it literally mean all? I don't know. But when they're gone, okay, so who now restraineth will restrain and um, I think the King, the King James, yeah, it says, let it, who now, I changed this. This is not King James. I changed it because it's a little bit confusing because the King James says, who's will let it, will let, but let it and let means like restrain. So that's why I picked this one because it specifically says restrain and it's very similar to the King James. So that's why I chose that if you're wondering. Okay, so the salt restrains the leaven until he be taken out of the way in the rapture. And then shall that wicked, because Christians would, would out him in a second, who's the wicked? Everybody should know that. That's the Antichrist, right? So if the Antichrist was to come onto the scene, every Christian, every you know good Christian, it doesn't even have to really be a good, I guarantee you there'd be a ton of, bad Christians out there be going, that, that's the Antichrist. Right there, that's him, the Antichrist. Like, so you would think, you know, like the church would have to be gone. Um, But we know that, you know, it, they says that he would deceive the very elect. Well, he must be that good that he can deceive the, you know, he could almost deceive the very elect. Of Christ. Okay. So anyways, and then shall that wicked be because Christians would, would out him. Okay. Be revealed. So after the fruit of the earth is gone, after the, all the Christians are gone, right in the rapture, they can reveal the wicked um, whom the Lord, who is not the restrainer. Okay. So whom the Lord, see, that's why, okay. So here we go. This is why they say, oh, well, it can't be, it can't be the Holy Spirit because right here it says Lord. Okay. So whom the Lord, which is not the restrainer. Okay. So it's not the Holy Spirit up here. will consume with the spirit of his mouth and will destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, these are just my thoughts. And, um, you know, like the 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 non pre tribs like do have a point. Like, how could this be the Holy Spirit, and and then be talking about the Lord down here? Um, like, I can totally see their point there. So I think that that it kind of works there. I don't know. Let me know what you think about that. 
So it says, and every oblation of thy meat offering, don't forget that's grain, offering shall thou season with salt. Every offering he wants seasoned with salt. Salt being like the disciples, like, like you know, us. Neither shall thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from them thy meat offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer, he says it three times, salt. Interesting. Leviticus 2.13. And I'm done. Hey, Ashley, um, do us a favor before you answer questions. Yeah. Just give us a, a, a conclusion besides I am done. I mean, you know, tie it all together. Think about how you introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, Man, that's hard. Okay. So, you know, based on the kingdom um, and the word of the kingdom, like we should, we should be working to be disciples of Christ. We should be the salt of the kingdom. Um, we should be bearing fruits for the kingdom. And we should be telling every, all, all of our, all of our fellow Christians, you know, who, who think that there's going to be no negative judgment at the judgment seat of Christ whatsoever, who think that heaven is a utopian, like this is my favorite place. Like I'm going to do whatever I want. And, treat it like that, like you should really explain to them what's really going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's really important um, to wake them up because I don't, I don't want to see any Christian, none of my brothers and sisters have a negative reward. I want to see them all ruling and reigning with Christ, having fellowship with Christ, getting to experience the city of reward. Um, yeah, that's my goal. Is I I really would love to see everybody reign, which I okay, know won't happen. Can, can you uh, pull up your screen for citations so people can see some of the resources that you used? Because that was one of the questions that was asked yeah. in the chat. Yeah, and I'm gonna I want to share. Can I share my slides real quick with the? Yes, audience? yeah. Just send the link and and we'll pin it. Yeah. I'll make this big real quick. And then while they're looking, I can share the put it into the chat and I can put it in the comments too, like after the video ends. Right. Okay. So view the slideshow. So go. you, your conclusion that you just made was an application conclusion. It was a challenge to the audience. You basically said, okay, the reason I'm giving this presentation is because I want, I don't want you to lose your reward. I want you to be ruling and reigning, but uh, to go over your argument, like interpretation, not application first, uh, and just go over how you began, what you, uh, what your main points were, what you use to support it, just the skeleton of it. Not, I'm not telling you going to full blown argument, but so that people can can understand what you have attempted to do in this presentation. Okay, give me one second. Let me share this. Um, okay, I just put it in the chat. Okay, so. Um, in this presentation, I'm trying to get you to see that um, that Christ has called, like why Christ called out the church, what the purpose of that was, and um, our part and our purpose being to rule and reign with Him because His nation Israel rejected His kingdom. Um, and I'm trying to get you to see that through the parables. Of, of Matthew 13, which he spoke to the Gentiles by the seaside. Um, I'm using multiple resources and I should have put um, on here the book that I'm currently reading, but not completely through, which is um, The Coming Kingdom by Dr. Andy Woods. I was like floored to find out that he, like I was reading the parables and I 
and I had already taught a lot of these parables and like had had, you know, the information in my slides for it and was reading his his book. And he he interprets the parables exactly like I I was seeing the parables, which was amazing. I was, you know, in awe by that. Um, so I need to add his book one there by Dr. Andy Woods. I've been influenced by all of these writers, uh, Dillo, uh, you know, Joseph Dillo and Final Destiny, um, and A. A. Edwin Wilson, um, G. H. Lang. Um, he was one of the first ones that came out for the pre-tribulation rapture when it was severely not popular. Um, like nobody was talking about it. He did hold to like a, a, a like a partial rapture, but um, he was he was um, he was persecuted and he was like shunned by his brethren, his you know his fellow um, his his fellow brethren for for holding to like even a, a like a partial pre tribulation rapture, and he understood the kingdom of God pretty well, and he um, I've I've read most of his books. I'm in the process of reading that one too, Firstborn Sons. Um, James Hollinsworth is a, is a, a pastor. Um, he's written a couple books and um, he's also done like a series and I've watched a lot of his actual sermons from his, his church. Um, he wrote the kingdom according to Jesus. And so he has volumes one and two out. Um, and Arlen Chitwood, probably one of the biggest ones. Um, He's fantastic. He's a scholar. He's more like Dillo in the scholar field. And Hollinsworth is more like, um, you know, he's a pastor. He's more like a teacher. He can explain it in, on your level. Um, so he's pretty awesome. Um, and then, of course, David Works. He, you know, I read his his paper on Judas. Um, okay, so. Sorry, Jenny, can you remove the comment? So we could see the rest of the screen. Thank you. All right, go ahead. Um, how did I do? Did, what else do I need to do? I I forgot what you told me to do. <laughs> oh well, no. I whenever I whenever I told you about giving a conclusion, you mm -hmm. went to the challenge application. I basically said, okay, this is how you make you know um uh, explain your interpretation, what you were trying to you know your introduction. Your inclusion, your support, parts of structure. Um, a lot of times, whenever you're doing PowerPoints, they tend to be inductive; they unfold. And sometimes it's good to put a deductive structure out there. You know, the whole saying: "Let me tell you where I'm going. Let me take you there, and then let me tell you where I took you." You know that type of thing. Yeah. So, uh, but no, that that's no big deal. I just wanted, as they say, put a put a bow on it. You know put a mm -hmm. ribbon on it or whatever, but, uh, okay, Janet, start going through the questions and Ashley have fun. All right. Okay. Uh, I hope that you didn't, you didn't heard my cat in meow. So, <laughs> so we start on the first, uh, question from, uh, okay. From news unit says that that you know, since I was turned over to Satan for the destruction of my flesh, does that mean my uh, also status is revoked? Revoke. I think that's not okay. That's not you know. Uh, can we can we stick to questions on, that are like that pertain yeah. to money? But the answer is, news unit, no, your salvation is not revoked. You're eternally secure. Turning over to stain for the destruction of flesh is not referring to the loss of salvation, and it doesn't mean you're not saved. Okay, thank you for next that. One. Next, next one is the news unit. Also, it's the same question. Has it changed your, your status in the kingdom of God? Okay, Killer Banana said, if a believer stopped believing, then... He's not condemned according to John 3, 18. Because That's not a that, question, Janet. Remember, Janet, read the yes. ones that have TLS in front of them, not all comments, because it'll take hours oh, yeah. to read them all. Oh, yeah. Sorry. 
Uh, this is your banana. Uh, Ashley Mayer still is, do you believe Acts 20.32 and Acts 26.18 could be about positional sanctification in Christ? Uh, can Do you want to pull up those verses so people can see them? Like, what you yeah, yeah, I, I got yeah. it. I got it. Okay. Acts what? 2032 um, and 2618. All right, let's do 2032 first. Yeah, share your screen, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, do I need to stop sharing or can you do that? No, no, I got it. Okay. All right, 2032. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. What do you think he means by positional sanctification? Because when you use, use the word positional, like a lot of times when you use it, you're talking about it's like um, like being regenerated. But um, I feel like that's not what he's talking about, that he's he's talking about your position in like in the kingdom. Is that how, how do no, you that no uh, positional uh, sanctification is almost like a technical term that's in existence now in theology, at least within our circle. So I'm just looking at the map, right? Uh, I need to make this one bigger. So position, experience, and ultimate. And so the uh, thing about it is, is that positional sanctification is the fact that at the moment of salvation, you're you're taken out of the kingdom of darkness and put into the kingdom of light or of his dear son. You're transferred from the king uh, from death to life positionally. So is this what is talking about when like um, Woods is talking about like our our legal? We are le like we are seated in the heavenlies, like the legal. Yes. Stance? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now I understand. Yes. Okay. So in light of in light of what the passage says, the issue is. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Now, is this supposed to be who are sanctified positionally or is this who are being sanctified experientially? It seemed like you were saying that this is experiential sanctification because you it, you made the reference that not all believers would receive this inheritance. So he's saying this is a positional sanctification. Well, he's asking a question. He's yeah. asking a question. Yeah. Okay. So is this one of the verses that I read? Is that yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. So there's grievous wolves entering in among you, not sparing the flock. Uh, they're speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember by the space of three years, I cease not to warn you night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God. He's given them to God, to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. OK, so that is like a present tense language. So that's I would say that's experiential right there and sanctification right. to give you an inheritance is he's able to build you up to give you an inheritance among all of them which are sancti uh, sanctified, among all of them which are sanctified. Okay, so why couldn't that be which all of them that are sanctified, the ones who have already been, you know, like are, are dead and sanctified? Like, it's because you're among those that are sanctified. Well, let's use, let's use your terms. Okay. Positional, I mean, let's use our terms. Positional, experiential, ultimate sanctification. Mm -hmm. What is your position on that? What do you believe this sanctification is? Is it positional, experiential, or ultimate? Well, to build you up would be would be experiential. Yeah, that's experiential, but what is yeah. the sanctification? 
I have to uh, among all of them which are sanctified. So I, I feel like that's like positional right there because it's like you're among okay. the ones that are sanctified. Right. So I think his question relates to this to build you up, right? Yeah. And to give you an inheritance. The question is, do you have the inheritance now? Or yeah. will you have it in the future just because you're positionally sanctified? Yeah. Or is this saying that your inheritance is dependent on you being experientially sanctified? Oh, man, that's a good question. Right, because the, that's the issue about inheritance. Is, is this talking about positional inheritance or another type? Is it talking about de jure versus de facto, you know? So, I mean, it's yeah. that's a good point. I mean, really the part of it... The participles being used here, you know, and just by looking at the English, R can refer to the state, you know, uh, and uh, so those are those are decisions you got to make. So that's a good question, Killer Banana. Um, really? So all right, but all we're doing right there is we're running the chart, uh, the observation, consider the possibilities. Yeah. So you you can see why Killer Banana might put this passage or parts of this passage in a different place on the yeah. chart than you might okay all right okay. let's go to acts twenty six eighteen. all right to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. See, this is a perfect uh, idea here. Okay? Yeah. And, and so that could focus on the abiding results, the present results. Uh, there's different ways to evaluate the perfect, but how do you view this sanctification here? Do you like, believe it's positional, experiential, like, or ultimate? You're talking, like you're talking about the de, fa de facto one, where like it's like the legal standing, like this is your. Well, let's let's talk about sanctification before all we right. talk about inheritance. All right, all right. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and, and so what do you what is saying the forgiveness of sins part is the you want to deal with first? No, no, uh sanctification. Oh, and okay, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Okay, you're reading from the King James now, right? Yeah. All right, the NASB has those who have been sanctified. Oh, and, and and that's because the perfect tense can be taken that way. See, in the previous passage, the word uh, sanctified, who are sanctified, it's also perfect. But the NASB there says those who are sanctified. But in this other passage, they said those who have been sanctified. When you're talking about the perfect tense, the traditional way of dealing with the perfect is it can focus on the past action, right? Or it can focus on the present results. So, um, for example, go go read uh, Ephesians two eight in your King James real quick. Ephesians two eight. Um, for by grace ye are saved. Ye are ye saved through faith. That and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So you see how it said ye are saved? Yeah, or is are it says are ye saved? Right, right. Yeah. So uh, so that's focusing on your present position. Okay, you right. are. But the uh other translations like NASB says, for by grace you have been saved, which okay. focuses which focuses on the past yeah. and the and and the results whatever. Yeah. And this is a this is a paraphrastic construction which is basically when you have a to be verb with a participle. Yeah. So it's a little bit different however it's still a perfect uh participle. So and the the, it, the issue the issue that you have 
is when you're dealing with the perfect, and we're just going with a classical, traditional articulation of the perfect, is that it can focus on the past, it can focus on the uh, uh, the results uh, that exist now, uh, or at least at the time of the writing. And then there's even times whenever it can have just a present force or um, and there's other ways that it can be used. So my point is, is that you got to run it through the chart. So yeah. do in, in this passage, do you believe that sanctification is positional, experiential, or ultimate here? It seems like it's positional. But okay. so, so you're going to be among the people that have already been sanctified by faith that is in me. And oh man, and it could also even be like people that's already dead. That it could be like, couldn't it be like you know the end when like, oh, uh, what's the uh, how how? Well, he's talking. He's talking to live saints. I understand what you mean by that. Uh, so I, I understand what you're talking about. That. And remember, he's talking to the church too. So the the Israel, whenever they receive the new covenant uh, in the tribulation or at the end of the tribulation, that's not the church. Your pre-trib, the church has been removed. So that eliminates some options, at least if you're going to go with a pre-trib standpoint. Mm -hmm. The issue is, is that if you say uh, sanctification is positional, then does that make the inheritance positional? That you that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified. So... Well yeah, well, I'd say absolutely not because it talks in the in the the opening of it to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. That's not you know saving them. That you know in the Old Testament, often Israel was talking about like having their eyes darkened or like them being in darkness. Um, you know when they're when they're in darkness, they're away from fellowship with God because God is light. So they're just out of out of fellowship with God. They need to come back into the light, into the fellowship. Of, of God, so you um, don't think this? You don't think this passage is talking about the salvation of the Gentiles? And I am Jesus up here, but uh, but rise and stand upon the. Well, it has, yeah, it has to be because it's talking about Paul. So I it appeared into this purpose, make thee a minister of witness of both these things thou hast seen of those things which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people from the Gentiles from whom I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan until into the power of God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I didn't even. I was just reading the one verse. I went. I didn't even read it. The beginning of that. Yeah, I would Sorry. have to say it would be. Man, I mean, and and you know, to be honest with you, there's there was Gentiles in the synagogues that were saved also. So you know, turning the Gentiles from darkness to light too could be you know, saved and unsaved. Like I, like I said before, yeah, receive for yeah. forgiveness because even forgiveness of sins, you know, you can still like, I still receive forgiveness of sins too. And an inheritance among them, which are sanctified by the faith that's in me. Okay. But again, you, I, I, I would totally be okay. What I'm trying to say is I'm totally okay with either view because in either view, you, you receive an inheritance, you receive, everybody receives Christ. As an inheritance, there's two inheritances. Everybody receives Christ. All the Christians received Christ. Okay, anybody who believes it receives Christ. But the um, the inheritance of the rulership of you know, being an heir, being a firstborn, is conditional. So it works in both ways. Right. And, 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 yeah, and, and I understand that. But you see how you treat every word of the sentence like a variable. You know, and you and you run it through the chart to consider the possibilities because the the chart is an observational tool. It's a diagnostic tool to, yeah. to evaluate the possibilities. Because some people would say, "Oh, this is positional sanctification. This is positional inheritance. Therefore, you can't use this passage to say that some believers will inherit and others won't." Yeah. So, um, okay, uh, let's Janet. Let's go to the next one, whatever it is. Okay, we have in his hand said, um, Lemon Seminary, uh, with all my attempts to share Jesus with people, is there a reward for that, even though I don't see truth? Results. Uh, I'm sorry, results. 
didn't Jesus say, blessed are those who, you know, whose feet like, you know, takes the gospel out. And I don't see why that wouldn't include like, you know, just taking the gospel out. It's not you who are supposed to get the increase. It's God that gives the increase. And you have no idea what your seeds are doing. And if they, you know, the planted seeds causes those people to be saved later. Um, so, I mean, why wouldn't you be rewarded for serving him? Yeah, you're rewarded for your faithfulness to be obedient to God's word in, in a given situation. Uh, just because you're faithful does not mean that it's going to have the results of a person coming to the Lord or, or, or growing or spiritually, whatever. Jeremiah was faithful and he didn't see very many results. You know, there's other people. Even Jesus' ministry didn't show a lot of results initially. Um, but yeah, you're, you're rewarded for your faithfulness as a steward. Thanks, Ashley. Next, Janet. Yeah, even though you didn't see the results. Okay, next is uh from uh krista g tos question why do you think free grace become fractured with hyper grace i don't i don't know i don't know how to answer that question it's not really related to my presentation but um maybe you know too related to to the kingdom like hyper grace view and I have very limited knowledge of hyper grace, but hyper grace view sanctification as like, uh, like it's like us preaching sanctification, like in trying to be sanctified and trying to live our lives holy. Like they see us more as like a like a legalist, or they try to say that we we are becoming. Um, we're trying to use it for our salvation too, like which I don't relate to salvation at all. But they they just don't believe in preaching sanctification at all. Um, so they don't they don't even believe that you have to confess your sins after you when you sin, like after you become saved. So. I mean, why would we not fracture with that um, for somebody to say, like and, and say, like the book of James is not a scripture and to say that um, you don't have to confess your sins and. Um, like we didn't really, we didn't really fracture with them. They fractured with us and called us, you know, they, they, they dropped the H bomb on us and, you know, basically said that we're not saved. So, I mean, like we try to, um, we try to reconcile and to, to, to fellowship and stuff like that. We try to debate, um, and they won't have it. So, you know, all we can do is is reach out the olive branch and and um, you know try to to reconcile our our differences and because that's what Christ told us to do. But that's what we can do. Thanks, Ashley. Yeah, Chris is uh, new to the channel, um, and so yesterday, you know, we did a stream on hyper grace. Then we did one on the crossless gospel, and yeah. now we're doing something on the kingdom. Yeah. And uh, there were things that were brought up in those previous streams that they've been still thinking about and wondering about, you know. So uh, that's essentially what's going on here. Okay. Okay, Janet, next one. But, okay, uh, we have uh, two questions left here. And uh, next is from Killer Banana again. He said, "TOS, is there an aspect of the inheritance that all believers get?" Is any? Yeah, I already, I already alluded to that. That's in Romans. Um, it's like I think it's very clear in Romans. Uh, let's see, Romans eight seventeen. Let's see. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may, that we may be also glorified together. And then mute your mic, please. So, all, all 
children of God. There's a difference between children and sons of God. And if you if you look at the Greek when you're going through the scriptures, because the the manuscript like the the translations, I I haven't found any, and I I might be wrong. I might you know I, I haven't found like the King James doesn't translate some of them correctly. Like they'll they'll put the word um, children when it should be sons. Um, because children is, uh, I don't know how to say Greek, but it's like technon, T-E-K-N-O-N. So if you see the word technon, you're supposed to, you know, translate children. Um, but if you see the word uh, weos, I think it is, it's like, it's like uh, uh, H-U-I-O-S or, or Y-H-I-O-S or something like that, weos, that's a son. Um, so like, so children are the all the children of God, including like all the carnal Christians and, and all of them. OK, so so if you're ch a children of God, then you're an heir of God. You're an heir of God. You're going to inherit God. Um, but there's a second inheritance. And this is what I was talking about. Number two and joint heirs with Christ. OK, so everybody inherits God. OK, but there's a joint heir with Christ category. And that comes with a if if. So be that we suffer with him, if we suffer with him, if we serve him, then we may also be glorified with him. So there's the two different inheritances. Okay, next question. For the last question for today's Ashley's presentation is from uh, Graham said, uh, Teal is, Meat was a generic word for food. It could include meat, but not necessarily mean plants only. Oh, I don't know. Um, I one of the sources that I was reading, it just said that it was like a Hebrew source. It said that um, like it meant grain, like back in the day. But it could, I could be wrong about that for sure. It could mean all food. I don't know. Yeah, so we can trace that down for a minute, yeah. but uh, part, I know today, fruit, like uh, you can talk about the orange, and you can talk about the meat of an orange, you yeah. know? So, like um, that, yeah. All right, so let me share my screen. Uh, we'll go to John 4, because that's where Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of God uh, in the King James. I think that's the way to put it. To it. And... Uh, So, let's see. Here it is, 32. But, he's, but he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know of. And they stopped saying one another. No one brought him anything to eat. That he, he said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Okay, so food is gross in. What? Yeah, so here's the bedag right here, but we'll go to the sense lexicon. I mean, the, the lemma, the, the range here. So you see that it can mean eating, food eating, or consuming. Even rust, because the process is eating material and stuff, it could be related to that. So you see that there. Okay. As far as uh yeah, what's what's that term? Thrombosis or whatever? Yeah. Uh what is thrombosis? Isn't uh, it related to plant rust or something? I can't remember. T A R O M B R it has to do with the heart, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes, you're right. It does. A blood clot within blood vessels that limits the flow of blood. Uh, yeah. Uh, more. Okay. So I'm wondering what the brosis ending is related to. Uh, thrombosis. Greek. Plotting. Okay. Maybe. I don't know. I don't think it's necessarily the same word, but um because it's thrombos and from there we could go i'm looking right here at the the roots yeah i, I don't think it's related i th I thought maybe it was 
But anyway, um, okay. So it, it's being used that way. Now, what we can do is we can see how it's used in the Septuagint. And it's used for food, nourishment, ekal, ekala. These are all words that are all, you know, that's the main word that's being used there for food. Okay. So uh, it, it, what, it, I think it's a contextual issue, you know. Is it ever used for grain? You know, we can, let's let's just uh, bradag, uh, bradag, and then let's look at the main definitions. The act of partaking of food or eating. Now, I don't know what passage you were drawn from about that was uh, the meat. It was the it was all the offerings of the grain offerings in Leviticus. You could all you okay. have to do is look at look at the other Bible. Yeah, we have that Cody okay. Jacobs comments. Uh, the All right. Leviticus 2.13. Yeah, we'll bring up the Septuagint too. Leviticus 2.13. All right, yeah, so... I don't think it's translated yeah. meat other than in the King James. Okay. Leviticus 2.13. Every grain offering of yours, wherever you shall season salt. Okay, and then the word grain is right here. So I'll pop that up so people can see it. Uh, where is it? Census. Yeah. Minka. Grain offering, offering gift or tribute. Okay. And uh, so we can see what, we can go back and we can look at, uh, let's go ahead and just go broad real quick and just type in the word for grain. And, and so in the Greek, these are the words that are translated as grain. Okay. Let's see if minka is included in. Yeah, it's right there. Gift, present, veneration, thanksgiving, homage, alliance, tribute. So the word grain, of course, there's the Hebrew. So uh, why, but, why, did the, why did the King James translate it meat then? Can you go to the King James and see, like, I'm sure it's the same right. word in the Greek, right? I mean, it has to be. Yeah, that. well, the reason, when I'm looking, when I'm looking at the English word for meat, uh, for the Hebrew, basar, which means flesh, a lot of these are related to that. Um, eights, but yeah, so the King James... Let me pop open the King James here. Oh, no. Wow, it's going trippy over there. All right, so Leviticus what? Leviticus 2.10? 2, 2.13? 2, Is that what you yeah, said? 2.13. All right. And see, I don't like the fact that this thing is not key to my King James. But I can do it this way. I can switch it here. Yes. KJB. All right. So the words translated as meat, yeah, that's the thing is, is that the word in Hebrew, minaka, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, minka is translated as meat in the King James, but it can mean grain. Look. Uh, there's other words for it too, but a lot of words. So the question, so yeah, the question is, does it ever mean meat itself? Okay. I don't, I don't, in the King James, I don't think so because, I mean, not in like when it's talking about the offerings, because when it's talking about the offering, it literally says like a goat or a bull, and that's when it talks about yeah. the meat, it doesn't just say meat, it says the animal. Yeah, well, I mean, if you just do English, if you just go from English, if you say the meat of something, right? Yeah. What do you mean? Uh, let's see. Let me do it this way. So it's I think it's just a contextual thing. I think meat meat can refer to food. Um, but the question is, and I don't have, you know, I'm not real big on the King James, but we could ask the question meat meaning 
and KJV. And we go to we could go to something like this, the uh, right here, and you see that it's used in the King James version. According to this, is food in general. So essentially, what you have is you have the word meat that represents this, and then within it, you got you got fruits and you got vegetables. Okay. I'm, I'm not sorry, fruits, vegetables, we'll put fruits and vegetables on one side and meat on the other. But all of this, all of this is meat or food from this standpoint. So, it, I mean, that, that seems to be how it's being used. Meat, food in general, anything eaten for nourishment, either by man or beast. Um, yeah. So that doesn't include sugar. I don't know. I'm just picking. Okay. Because it's not for nourishment, you know? Oh, yeah. But it could be based on appearances. Oh, uh, yeah. My initial statement was meat equals meat, depth of scripture. It's not grain anywhere. Okay. Hold on, Janet. I want to read what. Uh, he said, my initial statement was meat equals meat. Depth of scripture, it's not grain anywhere. The, are you saying the English word never refers to meat? Is that what your initial claim is? Because if that be the case, the Leviticus passage that she brought up. Where was it? 213. Yeah. And every oblation of thy meat orphan shall thy season with salt. Neither shall thy suffer the salt of the covenant lacking from that meat offering. Yeah, I don't I personally don't think bread is included in that concept there. Um I think that this is actually talking about animal meat. But that's just based on context because what kind of meat are we being offered here? What kind yeah. of sacrifice is it? You know? But hold on a second. Listen. Because you got unleavened cakes of fire right here. Go ahead. So it, if you back up, it goes. No meat offering in leaven, which ye shall bring unto the Lord, shall be made with leaven. Okay, why would you put yeast on protein? Like no meat, right? Well, I I get I get you. I see what you're saying, but if you back up a little bit more, right? In three, I think it is, and the remnant of the meat offering shall be Aaron and his sons. It is a, uh, so. It says this shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mingled yeah. with oil. Yep. Right, but that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the meat is the cakes. It could be referring to the fact that you're making meat and a cake. Uh, we would have to back up even more. Well, for just when, go to the NASB, and it tells you it's going to tell you if it's meat or grain, <laughs> or 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 like you know, if you look at the end, it the only problem is is the King James, you know. So just go to yeah. NASB, and it tells you. Now, anyone presents a grain offering as in the offering to the Lord, the offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. So you think there's no animals here. It's not just in this grain. one. Yeah, right. not in this one. Right, right. So the issue is, and and, and I, I'm still not under, I'm still trying to get clarification about what uh yeah, okay. Janet, I want to focus on Dutch's comments real quick. Because you have offerings for meat and grain and meat only. Yes, I know. It has two different offerings. Okay. But what is your point? God's saying it's a meat only offering. Which passage? <laughs> so this Leviticus and Leviticus 2, it's all about a grain offering. Yeah. It sure looks like it. Well, anyway, um, 
All right, I want to do, since you, everyone's questions are done, is that correct, Janet? I want to talk about some things. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so, Ashley, the main thing that, that I want us to be wrestling with or thinking about, in addition to the application stuff you brought up, is the church, what is the church's relationship to the kingdom, if at all, okay? Now, when you were in Ephesians, you made reference to the mystery. And I don't know if you misspoke or not, but there's, do you know the difference between uh, normative dispensationalism versus progressive dispensationalism? Are you familiar with those distinctions? I've heard of progressive, dis and that progressive means like kingdom now, doesn't it? It can, yes. Yeah, that's part of it. But the other thing is, is they see normative dispensationalism as articulated by Charles Ryrie, Elliot Johnson, uh, other people like that, Andy Woods. They would say the church was not revealed in the Old Testament and it didn't exist in the Old Testament. Okay. The progressive dispensationalists would say it was it it was not realized in the Old Testament. Okay. But they they would say that it existed in the Old Testament? It is tricky. I mean, uh let me show you. I'm going to bring up an article that I mean, one of the journal articles of my professor Jeremy Thomas. So, for, when you that I had for dispensationalism. I I got to question you further to clarify. So, when you say that it was not revealed and it was not realized, so as in that the kingdom was not on or when you say realize not on earth at that time or we're not talking about the kingdom we're talking about the church oh sorry the church okay. right so right the church That's... was not in existence at all right it was not in existence yeah. and it was not prophesied about oh you say it was not prophesied about no, that's there's nothing there's not uh, uh that's the distinction between progressive dispensationalism and uh because and, you know, people use the example of the peak in the valleys. You can yeah. see the tops of the mountains. You can't see what's in the valley because it, it's it's not revealed. But God didn't even reveal looking it. Back, even looking back, like you can't see it. No, no, because it's a mystery. A mystery refers to something that has never been in revealed because it has never existed. No, that's not how a mystery works. Like, no, I wouldn't say that that's the definition of mystery. It's not, you don't go back to the English definition. This is not Scooby Doo in the mystery van. This yeah. is so a I, mystery. Go ahead. go ahead. So, like, I, I would say, the, like, a mystery is like what it's not what we think of today, as in, you know, like, we, we don't know anything. If, if it's a mystery, we don't know anything about it. You know, that, that's right. like the, today's definition. Right. That's what I'm saying. The, it, the church was a mystery because it didn't exist and it wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. It got revealed after Acts 2 or at Acts 2. I would disagree with that. Okay. But I'm not a progressive well, sensationalist in any way, shape, or form, you know, but I just disagree well, with that. Well, I, all right. Well, I'm just going to introduce this, and you can do further research on this, okay, just yeah. very briefly. Very briefly, I want you to hear what this says. Okay, go. Um, so, definition of mystery. Tradition. Do you want to share your screen with me? Yeah, I'm sorry. Thanks, Asavo. Because this has implications about how we view the kingdom and the church. Okay. Okay. So, this is important. Uh, traditional dispensationalism. This is the first one. Traditional dispensationalism teaches that a mystery was objective truth not revealed in the Old Testament, but now revealed in the New Testament. Trench says a mystery in the constant language of Scripture is something which man is capable of knowing, but only when it's been revealed to him by God, and not through any searching of his own. Peter said a mystery was something revealed that was better unknown, and indicates this was a definition commonly held among theologians of his day. Holner says a mystery refers to something in ages past, hidden in God and unable to be unraveled or understood by human ingenuity or study. 
it until is now revealed. Until revealed, though, and we it has been revealed. No, and no, no, oh, about oh, it. Slow down, slow okay. down. Listen, right, right. listen what it's saying. You can't okay. study it and find it. Meaning, you can't study the Old Testament and find it. It doesn't exist in the Old Testament. But hold the, bo on. the body, of, the body of Christ did not exist until Acts two. I agree with that, but what it was hidden. It was hidden. It was hidden. So no, it didn't. It, 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 it didn't. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't exist. It's not an issue of hidden. It didn't well, it exist. Hidden. It says hidden right there. Hidden mystery. He's, maybe he's, hidden. he's talking about the idea of. He's talking about the idea of the word mystery right here. Okay, but yeah. you you you're interrupted. I was trying to finish the sentence. We need to give three different views, and then we can talk about them. All right. Honer says a mystery refers to something in ages past, hidden in God, an unable to be unraveled or understood by human ingenuity or study. It has now been revealed by the Holy Spirit to his apostles and prophets who in turn have made it manifest to everyone. Covenant theology teaches that a mystery was not totally understood or totally revealed, but it was the subject of Old Testament prophecy. Now, here's progressive dispensationalism. Progressive dispensationalism says, while all of the uses refer to divine secrets, we may divide the nature of the mysteries into three broad categories. So this is what they're saying. A mystery may be hidden in symbol or language with the inner meaning. Two, a mystery may be hidden because it's true. Its truth has never been the subject of objective revelation. And three, a mystery may be hidden in the sense that its truth has not yet been realized. So this here he continues. Which use of mystery do progressives apply to the key passage in Ephesians 3? Since they lump this mystery under the broad category of mysteries related to Christ and salvation, then progressives claim this mystery falls under the third use, that it was unrealized. They claimed that the new union of Jew and Gentile was hidden in the sense that its truth had not been realized. What they mean by hidden had not yet realized terminology is that it was not a manifested event. It had not appeared, was not yet existing, had not been realized in history as fulfillment. In short, they claimed that the church was the subject of Old Testament prophecy and was not in historical existence until fulfilled in the New Testament. Traditional dispensationalists can agree that the church was not in historical existence until the day of Pentecost, but it is that all the mystery was, or but is that all the mystery was. If that is the sense in which the church was a mystery, then any and all future events partially revealed in scripture are at present mysteries until they arrive in history. This even borders on the concept of mysterious to me. This leaves the concept of mystery quite vac vacuous. It makes much more sense to understand that once something is revealed, it is no longer a mystery, but a known fact. Further, what traditional dispensationalists cannot agree to is that the church is the subject of and fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. To maintain continuity and find the church is the subject of Old Testament prophecy, Progressive dispensationalists use a complementary hermeneutic, which allows them to give Old Testament texts new additional meanings. This is a form of reading the New Testament into the Old Testament. Their essential argument says that since elements related to the church are prophesied in the Old Testament, then the church must have been prophesied in the Old Testament. And, you know, we you, you can study it for yourself. Uh, Andy Woods brings this up, talks about it in the book and things like that. I'm just saying it's going to have implications on whether the kingdom was in existence. I mean, whether the church is in existence in those parables that you're that you were talking about in Matthew and uh, those other things like that. Also, it's going to have an impact on whether the the typology stuff that you brought up is actually about the church. You yeah. Know? So you're saying not even in the book, not even in the gospels, are you saying that like when, when Jesus says, I'm going to take the kingdom off of you and give it to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof, you're saying that that doesn't even mean the church. 
There are two views within dispensationalism. Some are more consistent than others. But one view is that when it's talking about ethnos, it's referring to a future generation of Israel, not the church replacing Israel. I don't know about that. Yeah, okay. I'll That's definitely fine. study it out more. But I don't, I don't see how I can see how it could be misused. Absolutely. Um, but I'm not, I'm not trying to misuse it and I'm not trying. No, no one's saying that. This is, this is, this is technical stuff. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm not being hard. I'm just, I'm giving this as an opportunity for us to expose. Look, if progressive dispensationalism is true, then I, by all means, I'm all with it. And it will be interesting, you know, cause Corey's going to DTS now and DTS is primarily progressive dispensationalist now. Yeah. Schaefer, Schaefer is exclusively normative uh dispensationalists you know so it'll be interesting to see where he lands up within dispensationalism yeah but no thank you thank you for what you've done it opens up things and i those were the two main things that i was thinking about is okay how do i i need to make so that whenever you're reading this additional material because uh dispensationalists have been inconsistent and they've they've read typology into things in times past they they had sloppy language they you know there there's been refinement in those areas I'm not saying we've arrived but there's been refinement in those areas and uh uh all of that's up for discussion you yeah. know but uh, thank you for your time uh, Janet is there anything you want to say um no I'm good. Okay. At, Just reading the comments. Ashley, do you have any closing thoughts? I do not. Are you, um, you, you, you totally caught me off guard with that. <laughs> Sorry. I'm thinking, I'm still thinking. Well, th this is the learning process. You know, I, I was trying to, like I said, there's some newer people here and they're like, is she presenting your seminary stuff? And I'm like, because because I was doing my homework, you know, on the other streams. Yeah. Like, no, this is her, this is your own studies. You'll cite your resources and all of that stuff. But yeah. the layman seminary is a place where you exercise your gifts, you get sharp, and you get evaluated. It's close to peer review, and and you know, in seminary, you got to do presentations and things like that. So it's just going to take a while. For, it's a little bit of culture shock, you know. I think what happens is in a lot of churches. You, you, this is a Wizard of Oz illustration. In most churches, you just see the big giant statue with the fire, right? Some churches, some churches or ministries will open up the curtain so that you can see the man pulling the levers. But what we're trying to do here is we're trying to teach you to pull the levers, to, to other people to pull the levers. You're saying, hey, look, this is how I pull the levers. You can do it too. We may not come to the same conclusion, but this is the methodology that we're using. So and it's just a little bit of culture shock. So uh, we just got to be patient with uh, people that are checking out the channel for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. And we have a, a you know, follow-up question from Cam. Uh, he said, uh, the parable of the vineyard owner, was that not the pre-runner, the introduction of the Gentile being included in the salvation through jesus no, gentiles have always been able to be saved ever since the fall the, the that's the thing you got to remember about these parables and stuff they're not talking about salvation they're talking about god's plan you know uh going from the theocracy to a post a kingdom postponement and then a future fulfillment you know they're all of that's involved as well um but yeah, it, it's a big topic, you know. Yeah. So, do you think anybody wants to come in with me? Oh, that's a great question. Does anybody want to come in? That is going to be nice to Ashley. <laughs> I want to. I want to specify that. And if we don't, <laughs> and if we don't know you, or if we've never had conversation, you know, on some type of social media, then we're going to ask you to show your face. And that doesn't uh, mean you have to agree with me. You can totally disagree with me. Just right, like right. I'm yeah, sorry. I, I forgot. I forgot I, about that part. I, I forgot about that part. So, are you able to share the link then? 
You are muted. You are muted, Johnny. How'd you get muted? I'm sharing the link. Okay. I don't know how he how he I muted myself. If I'm not okay. talking, I mute myself. Okay. So there's Graham again, a follow-up question. Uh Theo S. The Hebrews did they not refuse to evangelize? They did refuse. I mean that, yeah. Yeah, didn't God didn't yeah, they were rebu rebuked for not evangelizing. I remember, I don't know the exact verse because I don't I mean Cram knows the Bible better than I do. But so how is he relating this? Hold on. I'm I have a little bit of a headache. How well, are you uh, sorry, sorry. Uh so maybe maybe what Cram's thinking right here is I said that those passages were not about salvation, that the, the Gentile inclusion. Yeah, Israel had the responsibility to be a light, and that would include evangelizing. Uh that's but the thing is is that the mystery, the the Gentile inclusion in the church on on the same level as Israel, that had never existed before. That's what Ephesians is arguing. Oh, Cram is here. Hey, Cram. Hi, Cram. Unmute yourself, Cram. And Mark, I know you're out there somewhere. See, I haven't seen Mark in the chat, but I haven't got to look at the chat too much. He said hi initially when he first came. Maybe he fell asleep. Maybe he did. Cram left and came. Uh, he needs to come back. You, you're talking, Charlie, but you are muted. Okay, first and last is in here. Uh, he's going to give you a run for your money, Ashley. Oh, boy. But he, here you go. <laughs> no, no, okay. no. I just uh, no, I watched your, your stream on and off. But you, basically, one, one of the things you said was that um, when it says the kingdom of heaven, it doesn't really mean the kingdom of heaven proper like that. It means the word of the kingdom of heaven. Is that right? And you said that because of, I believe it was Matthew uh, 13, 19 or something. And when you say proper, you mean like the whole entire kingdom, like all three realms? Well, I don't know. I mean, I to me, it just says kingdom of heaven. So that's how I take it. But you're saying it's what he means is the word of the kingdom of heaven. Okay. So I, I that's when I was in the parables, right? Right. Okay, hold on one second, because he gives us a verse, because he tells us it's the word of the kingdom. Yeah, that's in, I believe. Uh, verse 11 and 19. Hold on, let me go there and I'll read it. Can uh, First, last, can you tell me what your position is and, um, you know, like what you, what you follow? It, well, no, I mean, if it, if it, if it means the word in some way that. No, I'm, I mean, like, are you free grace or, or not? I, I don't really follow those. You don't follow, okay. So you you're not disp uh you're not are you dispensational? Again, I don't follow those types of terms. I mean, I'm non-denominational. If that you're non-denominational, okay. I would call that a denomination. I mean, honestly, yeah. To be to be clear, I mean a lot of those terms is Calvinism. All you know all these terms i really i just don't get into those terms i'm just trying to figure out where you stand you know so like when i'm answering you i can answer you better that's okay. what i'm doing all right what's the passage so i could bring it up on log off okay so it's matthew 12 11 and can 19. You hear me? yeah we can hear you, can you. matthew 12 11 what 12 11 and all 19. Right. okay Or hold on, sorry, um, it's 13, sorry. It's Matthew 13, 11, and 19, I'm sorry. All right. The major delay on the... Jesus answered them, to you has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not been granted. Yeah. And then 19, you said, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, 
uh, the evil one comes and snatches away. So yeah, she's saying that the, the word of the kingdom, so it's a message about the kingdom. It's the offer of the kingdom. Uh, I believe that's what you're saying. Right, Ashley? Yeah, that's correct. So he's saying that, how do you know it's the word of the kingdom? Why don't you just take it as the kingdom proper? And that's why I don't take it as the kingdom proper, because it's the word of the kingdom, like the message of the kingdom, the gospel okay. of the kingdom, the good news about the kingdom. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely, you know, think about that when I see it. Okay, Cram, what's up? I guess uh, one of the things that actually kind of blew my mind on the first first uh, episode of this, whenever she said that that the kingdom was not particularly salvation, you said it was separate from something else. She made a distinction in there that I've never made, but in that parable that I that I spoke about with, is the one <clears throat> where the man makes the vineyard, you know, and he he makes a place to squeeze the grapes and all that. And he sent a servant. They beat the st servant and then they killed the servant. So finally it gets to where he says that he sent his son because surely they will respect the, <clears throat> the son. Well, wasn't that just a picture of the kingdom altogether? And, and God had sent his son. In other words, he sent them prophets, <clears throat> which would be the people that came before that. And they never listened. And then when he sent his son, his son was, came with the offer of the kingdom. They could have had the kingdom right then. But then as he progresses in this story, he says, but, uh, but you know, the, the vine, the vineyard owner, he'll kill those servants and then he'll uh, – put he'll go get new servants. In other words, he's talking about going to the Gentile in my, in my understanding of it. I mean, is that, is that your understanding of it? I'm, I'm trying to go there. I believe that's in Matthew 21. Um, it could be in Mark too. Cause I just read it. I just finished. Okay, Mark. All right. Get it. Just give me a verse. If you have a verse and I'll go there. Oh, yeah. Okay. I found it. And this is in Matthew, in Matthew 30, 30, let's see, uh, 30. 33, Matthew 30, Matthew 21, 33. Graphic say this. <laughs> Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard, vineyard and hedged, hedged it around about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to the husbandmen. And What's when, the verse, guys, so I can put it up uh, here? It's 21, Matthew 21, 33. And then, you know, following. Okay, land out to husband, went to a went to a faraway country. Okay, so I, I see that as a picture of, you know, Jesus um, laying the foundation of the, the, the message of the kingdom. And then he, he goes away. He's now he's sitting at the right hand of God. Like he goes into a faraway country, right? So... So kind of like the picture of like, you know, him Give leaving. Charles the book, book chapter verse. Yeah, Matthew 21, 33. Did you hear did you hear that? Yeah, I got it right. I got it right okay, now. Right. It's on the it's on the screen. Okay. And and when the time awesome. of the fruit draw near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen. Um, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. You know, they're talking about, so relating to the Pharisees and beating the prophets. And they did. They they killed pretty much them all. They killed the prophets. Yeah, yeah all of them. Again, he sent Most other them. servants. Yeah, other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But the last of all, he sent unto them his son, Jesus. It doesn't say Jesus, but it's, you know, that's what it is. They receive, and, and they will revere my son. They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir come. Let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. So, you know, like the husbandmen being like the Pharisees killing, killing Jesus. 
And they caught him and they cast him out of the vineyard and they slew him, casting him out of the house, you know, slaying him on Golgotha. When the Lord therefore, therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? And they answered him. <laughs> And they saith unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husband men, which shall render him the fruits in their season. You know, I even have my Bible given to the church, but I can see, you know, like, you know, you can make an argument from Charles's point of view too, saying, well, maybe that would be just giving it to better Jews. Um, Jesus well, saith unto I, I, them. I don't know, but... And I don't, I don't know what your opinion on it is, Charles, but I think that was all the Jews that didn't receive Christ at that time. It's like, yeah, you had an offer for the kingdom, but you, you turned it down. Right, and that they're going to get another, they're, they're going to receive the kingdom in the future, though. The nation right. is, not, not these individual Jews. No, they... Blew it. So he's so, going to see, the thing like, is the, the thing is is that ethnos is the word for people right here, and like I said, there there's two views within dispensationalism within normative dispensationalism on this issue. I personally believe ethnos is referring to uh, a future a future uh, generation that will of Israel. That's my view. I don't believe this is talking about the church. Yeah. See, I'm I I. I think it's definitely talking about the church. Well, the thing is, is if I'm understanding okay, the mystery up? correctly, if I'm understanding the mystery correctly, based on Ephesians three and Colossians one, it's impossible for this to be talking about the church. But but well, you got to study that out. For race, isn't it? Ethnos, isn't that eth for race? Eth eth ethnic, ethnic group or nation. Yeah. Right. No, we're different people, uh, Gentiles. I mean, either in the old old time, you were either a Gentile or a barbarian or a Jew. I mean, there wasn't very many other things to choose from. Yeah, I mean, like I but, said, there but, were two distinctions, Jew and Gentile, and that's it. But the kingdom of God is not going to be given to Gentiles. The kingdom of God is going to be given to Israel, and Gentiles are going to benefit from it. You can't change parties of the covenant. It, Gentiles are able to be beneficiaries, but they're not the parties of the covenant itself. Yeah. See, I would disagree with that. I believe that 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 their portion that that was promised to them is absolutely given to them, and that is the earthly portion. And that's where I make you know the distinction between the, you know the realms. And so, so there's a second realm in 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 the second heaven that the heavenly the heavenly portion of the kingdom that's being offered. That's I'm not, why. I'm not, I'm not denying that Gentiles get an inheritance, but whenever you go and look at Zechariah 14 and these other passages like that, it's back to the situation where they have to come up to Israel three times a year, offer sacrifices right. and all of that. The, the nations, the Gentile nations will benefit when they bless Israel, you know, during that time, the theocracy during that time. Yeah. So it, it's, it's yeah, not that... We're not Gentiles. We're Christians. Like there's three different categories. There's Jews, well, Gentiles, and Christians, and we right. are not Gentiles. Well, in First Corinthians ten thirty two, it mm -hmm. says, "Give no offense neither to the Jew, the Gentile, the Church of God, or the Greek." the The thing is, it mean it probably means a Jewish unbeliever or the Greek unbeliever. But whenever you're in the body of Christ, uh, you are the body of Christ. But the body of Christ is made out of both Jew and Gentile. Those distinctions do not go away just because the church has come into existence. I disagree with that. I believe it's a third category. Like it's a completely, you know, new cat. You've become a you've literally created you and made you a new man. You are no longer Jew or Gentile. You're made a new man out of the two. Okay. Think about this. Is, is the Jew or is the Jew still a Jew? Would we call yes. a Jew, and is it right to call them a Messianic Jew? No, like they're a Christian. They're not a Messianic Jew. They're like, a, if a Jew person gets saved, they're a Christian, not a Jew. Messiah and Christian mean the same thing. Messiah and Say that Christian. again. Messiah and Christ mean the same thing. Well, it's messenger. No, it means, Mashiach means smear or anoint. 
and and Christos means uh, the anointed. Yeah, that's, but they're not a Christian a Jew. They're they're a Christian. <laughs> they're just a Christian. They're not. No, no, a, no, I don't no, call myself a Christian Gentile. Paul calls himself a Christian Jew. Where? Paul identifies as a Jew. But only two, like, when he's trying to talk to the Jewish people, like to get them to understand, like he's like, yeah. I understand that. But the thing is, is that if you go away, if you, you can't say that the distinctions have been erased because in Galatians, it says there's neither male nor female, slave nor free. It's not saying that the distinctions are done away with. What it's saying is that now they can receive the assurance of being on equal inheritance. Uh, it's all right. It's all right. You got a lot of work to do as far as about studying dispensationalism. And that's great. I mean, that's that that's uh, uh, wonderful that this kingdom study is leading into that because I, I got lots of resources on that. I, I just took dispensationalism. I've been a dispensationalist a long time ago, mm -hmm. but um, you're asking good questions, you know, and uh, I think this relates to some of the eschatology stuff. You know, that we've been talking about and preparing for those other wars, you know, if you want to yeah. say. So I, I think I think I think you're right on to where you need to be. So I'm going to be giving you some resources in those areas. OK, and so I, I'm not trying to be cool. hard. We're just trying to refine things. Go ahead. And another thing, too, that that you need to think about, like, like. I mean, OK, like I'm a Baptist, but I don't. And, and I, you know, I go to my church, but I don't believe every single thing that they say, you know, so right. just because it, there's a distinction doesn't mean that I'm going to believe it all just because I'm that, you know, like just because I'm. No, a no, you no, know. I, I don't want. It's not about denomination. It's about hermeneutics, exegesis. It, I just want to help share the method and you make your own conclusions. OK. All right. Oh, all right. Hey. Yeah, Ashley, can I, I did have a more? question. Sure. Oh, can we can go we ahead. go back? Right. Can we go back to first last since since Cram just asked one, and then we'll go back to Cram. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Now this one, it's the same parable, <clears throat> not this well, it's in the same area. The children of the kingdom. Um, I mean, essentially, you know, like what you said, most people would think that you know this these are people that hear the word and essentially Christian people in a sense. Is that pretty much right or so it so you're in in general the children of the kingdom well in 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 matthew 13 yeah so these i wouldn't call them christians that because right in this in this part you know um they're not technically christian yet um i mean some of them you know they they do become christians but there's i would say that they're they're saved people um okay, okay. yeah yeah, no, no, no. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not trying to. I'm. I'm just asking for the sake of this question because okay. this term has always kind of confused me. And again, I'm not trying to throw a wrench in the system. But how do you think that squares up with Matthew eight, twelve, where he uses the same term, children of the kingdom? Matthew eight, twelve. Oh yeah. Okay. Um. And actually, it's not children. It's it should be son sons. Um, I believe. May okay. So hold on. Let me share my screen. I was say, Carl, can you pull up the Greek on that one? What it what is? But the sons of the kingdom shall be cast out in the outer darkness. There shall be weakening and gnashing of teeth. Okay. So, a, and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom of the shall be okay. Yeah, I'm ready for this one. We'll give you your oh, answer. Right, like there it is. Okay, so yeah, my my version, the King James says children. Um, this one says sons. I believe it is actually sons. I believe it's like the weos word. I don't know how yeah, to say yes, that. yes, it's weos. Okay. Is it we um, us? Yeah, it's we right here. Okay. Good. <clears throat> we so, are the nominative plural, but yeah. Okay, so this is right after he talks to the centurion. Yeah, that's what I said. Okay. 
So this is right after Jesus talks to the centurion. The centurion shows more faith than the the the, is, the Israelites, you know, do. And he he basically, you know, says, you know, like I give commands. I give commands and it gets done. So, you know, you don't have to go, just give the command. And and that's what Jesus does mm-hmm. and he marvels at at his faith. Um yep. and he says to them, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. I mean, I fully take that as, you know, Gentile salvation, you know, prophesied salvation in the terms of your 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 spirit and your soul, like getting actually saved and becoming heirs in the kingdom. Okay, so, but the sons of the, or the children of the kingdom, sons of the kingdom, um, shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, so, you know, I, I would say that this is talking about like the Pharisees or, you know, like the the ones that are supposed to believe on him, the, the Israelites, that he is preaching the word of the kingdom to his people. Um, they're going to end up getting cast out, not going to hell at all, because this is, you know, in parabolic language, um, you know, so it's as using, using as a metaphor um, into outer darkness, which means away from, you know, away from Christ, um, not in the kingdom or on outside of the gates. Um, like Charles, he takes it as like, you know, um, like a punishment, like metaphorically at the judgment seat of Christ. Um, I, we're going to do a study on this, like a really hard study of like, what does the outer darkness actually mean? And weeping and gnashing of teeth is just like a, like a Eastern, um, expression for like really sorrowful, like, like, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. That was really dumb. And like, you're just like, you know, mad at yourself for, for what you've done. So they're going to be upset about it. They're going to be thrown out of the kingdom. They're not going to be heirs of God. Um, not of God, but they're not going to be heirs, co-heirs with Christ. They're not going to be ruling and reigning. They're going to be in the kingdom, but they're going to be like least in the kingdom, it, you know, as a term that you might understand. They, one point, ruling and reigning. One point, of, one point of clarification, yeah. at least in this translation, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. It doesn't say they'll be cast out of the kingdom here. So they're in the kingdom. But they're cast out of the banquet, or they're rejected. They're not a- able to be in the party. You know, they're they're escorted out. They're let out, or whatever. You know, yeah. into the darkness outside the party. Oh, Just wanted to mention. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It does not say out of the kingdom. You're right. Okay. Now there might be other yeah, passages yeah. where it's used I've that got way. A Lord Chip uh, uh, Bible with notes, so it does say second death. Oh, in your, in your study Bible. Yeah. I mean, everybody's like, I mean, like I'd say 99% of the world is going to translate that. They're going to hell. You know, that's what, that's what people do. So. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. So I just want to let you know that uh, I'm going to go back and look at this part about the the chemistry of the bread and all that and the yeast. Yeah. That looks pretty interesting. Uh, uh, To uh, explain to the audience why you went into the bread and the yeast and all that scientific stuff. Uh, give a little bit about your background, not in detail, but I mean, you know, let them know that you're not just uh, uh, pulling some off, off the internet. You know what yeah, I mean? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I have a degree in biology. I, I graduated at the top of my class and, and I, and I teach, you know, I teach science and I also teach, you know, kids who, um, with behavior problems too, but that has nothing to do with that. But yeah. Um, and, and I almost got a minor in chemistry, but I didn't, but I did get an A in organic chemistry, which is the hardest class that you can take in under undergraduate studies. It was, it was very challenging. Um, and I, I, some I, theology. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I love science. That's one of my loves. Good. Thank you. That's cool. Go ahead, some theology. Oh, I didn't really watch the whole thing. 
I, I was just popping in and out. Uh, basically, the only main area of disagreement I have is generally the idea of, you know, God having an original position for someone and then taking that away and giving it to someone else. But other right, than it, right, because you're a universalist <laughs> and, and, and you want everybody to give, have the same results. No, it's it's a. Uh, it's the idea of of God having an, an already established position for you, and and that being it, it wouldn't be an equal. It, well, it's a on. position, a, a service. Yeah. It's not salvation. Yeah, it is. No, I am yeah. not talking about salvation. So some theology, um, it 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 speaks. It begins to speak of the kingdom, um, you know, back in back in the Old Testament. And it it speaks of it, it like there's a certain part of the kingdom that is guaranteed and there's a certain part of the kingdom that is conditional. And God starts giving all these ifs you do this and if you do this and if you follow my covenant it, and uh, you'll, you'll be blessed. And this is where the, all the blessings and curses is. I can't remember off the top of my head. Like I'd have to it's go back the to two, my previous two mountains, the two mountains in Deuteronomy, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, the two mountains, and he's given blessings. If, if you follow this, then you're going to be, you know, blessed. And if you don't, then you're going to right. be cursed. And um, it starts the land with will all of that. You out. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, it even starts before that in Abraham. Um, you know, when he's talking to Abraham, but it really starts in Exodus, and then he he finalizes that kind of, you know, the thought of of like the the conditional portion with David. Do you, I mean, uh, there I can find verses. Dutch, I don't know who you're referring to, but she's talking about the kingdom, the millennial kingdom. She's not talking about weeping in heaven. So some theology, do you want me to go? Oh, and, and honestly, I didn't even, at first last, didn't even get to finish like what he was, oh, I know no, he went to say I, something else. No, I was done. Thank you. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure. Okay. So some theology. Yeah, we're we're premillennial dispensational. The, that passage is talking about the Abrahamic covenant being fulfilled and the blessings that one will receive and the idea possibly that some are not allowed into the, the, the banquet hall imagery that's in the passage. It doesn't mean they're unbelievers. Um, so we're not talking about heaven. We're talking about the kingdom of heaven, which is another term that refers to the Davidic kingdom. The reason this is called the kingdom of heaven, because it, it will come from heaven when Jesus Christ comes back in the second coming and sets up the kingdom on earth for a thousand years. Some theology, are you looking or, or do you, are you like, because well, I can find the verses. Do yeah, you, I'm just looking at your screen right now. My okay. screen? Yeah, it's not yeah. mine. It's Charles. Oh, sorry. Okay. What screen, What passage are we going to? Well, I didn't know if he wanted me to go to those passages in the Old Testament so I could like show him that there there is portions well, of the and hey. Ebal. That's in, yeah, he knows. Him and Ebal he knows in Deuteronomy 27. He knows that there are conditions even in an unconditional covenant. Yeah. He knows that. So it's fair, you know, all was fair because yeah. God laid it out and he said, this is what's going to happen. And if you follow me, then you will get it. If you don't, then, you know, it's not, it's not going to happen. Well, yeah, I understand. There's, there's a difference between rewards and an inherent position. Right. And I guess that's, that's all I, I was trying to say at least. There's a difference. Which position are you talking about? A, a, like a job position? Yeah, that's oh. what I'm thinking about. Like if God what? chose you for a job, uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and then he's he's going to work with you, and it's like you might forfeit that at some time. But like the the story of Jonah, right? Or well, then uh, by that standard, then God is then Israel is still a theocracy, and we're still underneath the law. Well, I okay. My view is kind of bizarre. We don't really need to get into that. I'm still kind of deconstructing. Okay, so I don't view the law as a literal uh, thing to be obeyed. I think if you do, then it gets kind of weird. 
uh, because okay, well, no, it has under the law. So, so you're that, allegor you're allegorizing everything. Is that yeah, what you're saying? yeah. Okay. It 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 it, it uh, implies retributive judgment, and uh, I, I think that's kind of bizarre. It's not it's not bizarre in a theocracy, but no theocracy exists now. Well, no, I mean the concept of retributive judgment. Well, it's not purely retributive. I understand. Well, it's not purely retributive, but it's there are retributive aspects about it. Like, so you don't want you. like if they just follow it, they be blessed. Yeah, yeah, he'll take the blessings. He don't want the curses, though. Yeah, uh, I know. That's you know, just like my my kids will take the the ice cream, but not the wolpins. You know. I don't know of anything more literal than the laws of Moses. I don't well, think yeah. there is anything more literal. Well, no, there is there is debate in scholarship about how the Mosaic law, but the let, thing let is, is that a lot this, of that's I, influenced by liberals that are non dispensationalists. So why was why know. was David blameless for eating the showbread? Because the king, because he was rejected as a king and he was on the run. But but it's there's no clause in the law, is there? There's nothing in the law. No, that says. No, well, no. Let me explain. If the theocracy is not in operation at that time, how can you be? How how can you uh, hold the law to a certain standard? They did the worst thing. They rejected the king. So what does it matter if the king eats bread? Yeah, and to be honest, like if you look at it, like you know what. It, okay, so I know Charles doesn't like types and everything, but like, you know, David is a type of, of Christ, too. And if you look at it in that sense... Well, like, types of Christ are fine. I'm just talking okay. about types of the church. So, I mean, couldn't you view him as like, as, as high priest? I guess you probably couldn't, though. But there are, like Moses was priest and technically kind of like king. Um, there are there are types of like, and Mal Malachizedek was priest and king so why couldn't david be priest and king i don't know there, there, I, are, I there, are, there, there are similarities to that there's no doubt about it what the thing is is that jesus christ used that example when he was talking about the sabbath and so one argument that i learned years ago i mean i haven't visited it in a long time was that here they are they're tripping about the sabbath the yeah. pharisees and all that and they're rejecting the kingdom. They're rejecting the king. Yeah. So just like with David, uh, everyone's not going according to the law and everything. And David's on the run for his own life. What does it matter? I mean, what good? What? Who cares if you cleaned your room if you torched your house on fire? Yeah. You know. Yeah, that's true. And like you said, if like you're, if like you're, um, like you're. No, Moses now was falls the, into the it falls into the hole. Who's not going to pull him up out? You know, like if right. It's Moses ready to do, then you got to do it on even if it's on the Sabbath. Right, uh, Dutch. You're right. Moses wasn't a priest. He was from the tribe of Levi, but the Levites had not been designated as priests, of course, before he was born. So, yeah, he was a prophet. That's what it was. He was. He's a. You're right. He's a. He's kind of like a prophet and a king. Yes. Yeah, he was a commander. Yeah. So, so was so was jo Joshua. Yes, yes. Yes. Who else was a priest in a king though? That was that only Melchizedek then? Uh Let me think. I think so, yeah. Okay. Is it one's not coming to my mind? All right. So is there any more questions anybody have? Dutch, you're welcome to come in. Uh, uh, Cram had another question for me, I think. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Cram. Cram. Sorry, I think you're I stepped away for a glass of milk. <laughs> All right. No, I'm, I'm a white. Can you hear me? Did you, yeah. Did you have yeah, another well, question for me? 
Yeah, just continuing on that same scripture. Okay, it which one? That, the vineyard one? He, or one we were to well, on? He will. Um, when it was 2130 something. The vineyard one? It. 20. Yeah, it's uh, 2242. Okay. Because you read to where it says he will miserably destroy those wicked men and yeah. will let out his vineyard to other husbandmen. Yeah. Okay, so did you never read in the scriptures I mean, the stone I'm which... I'm not allegorize this. Well, I, I guess what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to reconcile this to what happened in the church. It says that... Um, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and let out his vineyard, vineyard to other husbandmen. In other mm -hmm. words, he's not going to work with the Jews anymore. He's going to work with, with well, not not the Jews in general, but he's not going to work with the unbelieving Jews. He's going to work with the believing Jews, Christians. Well, the thing is, then, is that according, um, according to Ephesians 3 and Colossians 1, the church did not exist. It did not. It was not revealed, and so these passages cannot be talking about the church. Yeah, but when you okay, so that's your opinion. But when you reveal something, that means that it is there. Then, then you make it seen. So it's there. Then you make it seen. Just saying. Yeah. Thing. No. No. When you go look at, uh, if you go look at Ephesians two. That's the revelate the revelation that comes to the apostles and the prophets comes after Acts two. The church came into existence in Acts two, and then it was revealed. That's what that that's what we're talking about here. It wasn't right, revealed. Wouldn't this be alluding to that? Wouldn't this be alluding to that? In other words, he knows that all the Jews are not going to believe, but there's going to be some Jews that believe. Yeah. But the, the the whole point is, is he's going to go get other husbandmen, which would be, we're going to go to I'm the not, Gentiles. I'm not denying that we are now serving in place of Israel right now. I'm not denying that. But that's an application okay. and an implication of the text. It's not the interpretation of the text. Yeah. And what I'm saying, right, is, I'm saying it, go ahead. Isn't it an illusion to it? In other words, alluding to it? Like a, uh, just like a, um, I don't know of any other word to use, but. Like I said, a text cannot mean what it had, what it did not originally mean. The meaning cannot be extended. It has to be remain stable. Now, what the gospel of Matthew is written for is to explain why the kingdom was not established. And yes, it's written during the church age. So yes, it has an implication and an application, but the reference that this is referring to, I believe that it's referring to uh, Israel. It's talking about the future because Jesus said, I, he says it in 23. Look, read what he says in 23. Yeah, but that's when he's talking direct. That's when he's talking directly to the bunch of. No, he's talking to the nation. Pharisees Jerusalem. Pharisees there. He's talking to the nation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the capital, right? Of the nation. Who kills yeah, the prophets. No, he the who kills there. He, he. Yes, the Pharisees are the representatives, the leaders, but the, the whole nation is being held accountable here. The whole nation is being temporarily okay. set aside until they say, blessed is he okay. who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, well, where's the Jerusalem, Jerusalem at? Hold on. Matthew 23, 37. Oh, that's in the That's where all the woes are. Yeah. Woe yeah. to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites. 23, 23. I, I, the prophets that stone us down, which are sent. Um, unto thee, how often will I gather thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wing, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. 
yeah, I mean, absolutely. He's talking to the Jews there. I believe that. Okay, so we're on 21, though. It's the exact same context. Comes over the village, he goes in the village, he goes straight away, he finds them. He's no, he's so he okay, he's talking to the Pharisees. Uh, the Pharisees yeah, he, are the leader of the nation. When he says Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he's not just saying, Oh, you Pharisees, Pharisees. He's talking yeah. about the nation being set aside. This was prophesied okay. with uh the war. Okay. Like I said, y'all just got to sharpen up in the area of dispensationalism. Then yeah, after you, you're saying after, that he's not, he's not going to give it to another nation. That's what you're saying. When it was said, the he's giving it to another nation. The the church, the word, the translated nation, it refers to the theocracy of Israel because in the future kingdom, there's going to be another nation. It's going to be the theocracy of Israel. I think that's reading into the text. Why is it? Because I'm not changing the definition of nation. No, it's another nation. That's not changing. Another the word the word ethnos can mean people or nation. Yeah, to it's a used that way in First Peter. Anyway, I'll I'll give you all the stuff and y'all can evaluate the claims of both dispensations yeah. in there. Some people are consistent than others. The the charge about the other ones is that it's creeping into progressive dispensationalism. Yeah, that's the that's the issue. I want you to understand is because you have two different seminaries. You know, yeah. Schaefer Seminary started to preserve the original distinctions of Dallas Theological Seminary because of uh, progressive dispensationalism and lordship, essentially. Um, so, yeah. Dallas, I, I just uh, want you to understand. Yes, it is. So okay, my my cool. okay. So my question is is. Okay, so he doesn't expect the fair. Jesus doesn't expect the Pharisees to see that coming. Like he's telling him, "I'm going to give it, give it to another nation." Whether the yeah. Pharisees think, okay, what they immediately think is, "Oh crap, I'm losing my power." Like I don't want to lose my power. I like my power, so I don't want to lose that. So they're enraged right now because they don't want to lose their power. Whether they think it's going to go to another nation, the Gentiles, or well, or another we, nation uh, in the future of Jewish people. Either way, they're losing their power and they're mad, you know? Well, so. you're, well you're doing a good task because you're asking the question, what would they have understood? What were they thinking? However, when we're dealing with prophecy and judgment, that does not mean the Pharisees knew the full implications of what was saying, what yeah, they were I, saying. I, I agree with that, yes. You absolutely. wouldn't understand this unless it was posthumously. You wouldn't have understood it this that whenever you heard this. I doubt anybody I know would have that. understood it. But like I'm saying, me looking back right now, I can see that he means it's the church and that's what happened. Okay. So y'all are insisting to doing this. So we're going to go into this a little bit detail. All right. This is just the beginning of it. All right. So let's go back. What's the passage about the nation? 22? 2244. All right. This is just going to be introductory. Okay. 22 44. I think it's 43, unless he is. All right. Okay. All right. So, all right. So, we're going to focus on okay, the nation part. 43, too. It's on 43. Okay, guys. Too. Both of them say right. nation. Matthew 22 43. That's what you're talking about, right? You're right. I was wrong. Uh, nope. It's 21 43. <laughs> Okay, y'all conf y'all confusing me like crazy. Sorry, it's twenty one forty three. I'm sorry. All right, twenty one forty okay. three. She's right. All right, Janet, you want to be the reader? Yes, no, maybe. All right. If not, I'll read. This verse continues to explain the parable of the wicked tenant farmers, because Israel leaders had failed in producing the fruit that God desired, and had killed his son. He would remove responsibility and privilege from them and give these to another people great ethne what god did was transfer the responsibility for preparing for the earthly messianic kingdom from unbelievers in israel and give it to a different group namely believers in the church all right so there's that statement okay now watch watch this next statement because this guy david turner who i'm actually connected with on linkedin He's a progressive dispensationalist. He says, 
David Turner argued that those who received the responsibility were the faithful Jewish remnant represented by Jesus, uh, Jesus's apostles. I don't have a problem with that. I honestly don't have a problem with that. But he said this is a very similar interpretation since Jesus' apostles became the core of the church. Matthew 21, 43 could be the key verse in the entire argument of Matthew. Okay. Uh, the usual term kingdom of God rather than Matthew's, uh, well, you already know about that. So let me bring this up. Custom kingdom of heaven. Yeah, give me one second. I'm going to get my uh, Israel distinction thing. Let's see, where is it? Um, New Covenant. I don't think that was uh, Israel. Believe, uh, I don't think that was Jewish believers because it says another ethnos. I think that means... Yeah, but it... But but it's it, it's how the word is being used there, other, because it, it's a contextual argument. I, like I said, I'm not sharp on it right now, but uh, here, I think I got it right here. Progressive dispensationalism. Um, I may have to give this to y'all later on and go through it, but... Um, It's about the kingdom here. Yeah, let me come back to it in the future. But uh, uh, I just want y'all to be aware there are two views within dispensationalism on the issue. And one of them claims to be more consistent than the other. Okay? So we can deal with that later on. Uh Okay, any other questions? Oh, man, it's getting late. I know Ashley's probably got to go. It's it's late. Yeah. You're what the one that's got a baby. Huh? Mark must have... Uh, Mark must have... Mark, yeah, he probably fell asleep. All right, well, guys, thank you, Ashley, for being here and everybody else for helping and Y'all for joining and we're gonna land the plane. The plane's about to be on the ground. Check out more content. Check out Ashley's series to get some background on where she's going with things and other things like that. God bless, guys. God bless.